Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I'm also somebody who has deconverted from Christianity, who was once a very devout fundamentalist believer in the biblical text and in the worldview we call Christianity. Today, I'm going to be discussing, or really not discussing, actually interviewing Dr. Jennifer Grace Bird on her life story, where she was, what happened, and where she's at now. Her story is her story, and nobody can take that from her. I hope if you're watching, no matter where you're at in your journey, on what you think reality is, or what you think the truth is, wherever you are, that you try to relate and empathize, to understand by putting on her shoes through her story. And she is a PhD. She's a New Testament scholar. I won't bore you with the details. In fact, I thought I would bore you with the details, but I want to keep this as fun and as authentic as possible without getting bogged down. And without further ado, let's introduce our guest. Dr. Jennifer Grace Bird, <laughs> welcome to Myth Vision. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, this is a little different than what we're used to doing. Yeah. And I, I want to dive into your life. This is your life and where you're comfortable going. But a lot of times when I interview academics who are experts in particular fields, they specialize on New Testament or Old Testament or whatever the particular is, um, I ask them to take us on a journey through their life and why they've come to conclusions that they have today. With you, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, just to start us off and in entering into your life, to introduce yourself to the audience in case they've never met you or they don't know who you are, mm -hmm. and then take us into your early years. Were you born a Christian? Was your household Christian? Did you convert to Christianity? Take us on that path. Sure, sure. Well, the quick introduction, I suppose, would be... Um, Right, right. I let me just name quickly that I my undergraduate degree was in mathematics. Um, I'm a philosopher and math mathematician by by trade, I guess. Um, and then I ended up going to uh, Princeton Theological Seminary for uh, Master of Divinity. That's a very intense three year program, which is long. I say that because I want people to understand. <laughs> I've spent many years. Is my point here, um, thinking about and learning about these things. And then I um, I started PhD work at Baylor University and finished, got to transfer to Vanderbilt, which was much better fit for me. And so I have a PhD in New Testament and early Christianity. So that's my, those are my credentials, if you will. Um, and yeah, and I've taught in many places um, along the way. So yeah, so there's the, the, the basics. Um, okay, so... Yeah, I, um, I'm from Virginia, and I grew up in a family. I'm the youngest of four siblings, the only female, um, and most of the stereotypes apply to me. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I grew up in a family that was United Methodist. So you Methodists are kind of middle of the road in terms of they're not, not typically very extreme um, and not typically terribly like proud and loud, but just kind of social justice-y focused is, right. right, I don't know, it, in case people don't know, different denominations where they kind of land and what they, what their flavor is, you know. Um, it's interesting, I've returned to my hometown, and I'm, and I have attended those, been in those spaces again, and many of the people there are much more conservative than I realized growing up, so I don't know if that's changed, but, um, so my experience growing up, right, in this Methodist church, was um, not very exciting, and I did not enjoy it. I, in fact, I think I, I think the spaces made me uncomfortable. Hmm. <laughs> the that particular building, the not, not, it's not like it was because of aesthetically. It was like a feeling, um, and I've I've mulled this over <laughs> quite a bit actually in the last twenty years, thirty years. Like, what was that about? Um, why do I feel uncomfortable in that building? Hmm. But I do. And I and I I think that in general when I go into churches. Um, so it's not about the people as much as there's something about what happens in the space, I think, that is just registering for me. Um, I'm not trying to get all kooky on you. I'm just it's just something I've mulled over quite a bit. If I could, I'm going to just, as your story yeah, goes along, maybe yeah. dig out some yeah. of the things that I think might the viewer might be interested yeah. in hearing, because I know I'm interested in that is. 
uh, were your parents devout? I mean, if you were putting on a scale, how sincere were they about believing Jesus rose from the dead? They may have been normal in their day-to-day -day lives, but did they, did they pray at home? Did they read their Bibles? Were you kind of involved in that? Was dad more religious than mom? What are some of those aspects? Yeah, well, they weren't very religious. Like we prayed, we prayed for before meals and we ate breakfasts and dinners together. Um, and so we said a, a grace, as people call it, um, before every meal. And my parents still do. Um, and, but I, like, I never saw them reading a Bible. They didn't pray, you know, do the whole like evangelical, like let's pray for, let's pray for them or let's pray together over that. Nothing like that at all. And, you know, they, I don't know that they have ever like thought of Jesus as saving us from sin. <laughs> like right. I don't, I don't think they've ever bought into that. And in fact, I've recently been having conversations with my dad and, you know, he's, you know, they just bring up stuff. They're like, what does this even mean? I mean, my mother is a former pastor and she's like, what does eternal life even mean? <laughs> like, wow. She, yeah. She's like, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. You know? So, so very not, you know, they were not conservative, it, you know, for us growing up. And so what I did experience was we were there every Sunday morning, you know, Sunday school church, and then back in the evening for like youth group stuff. And I went much younger because my oldest brother would be going. So like, our whole family would go back to church. You know what I mean? Like right. my oldest brother is nine years, eight years older than me. So by school year. So yeah, so it was, they were our friends. They were our kind of social outlet, if you will. You know, like that was, that was a community that we were a part of and that meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me, it, though I wasn't conscious of that at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, they were just there for you. And we did mission trips. We'd go help rebuild homes, not wasn't about converting people. It was about taking care of people. Right. Um, that was really, that was, that was great. You know, those were really interesting and those were good things to be a part of. I'm, I'm really grateful that I got to be a part of that stuff. My dad still does Habitat for Humanity actually. Um, so yeah, that's where my family was coming from. It was not, we were Christian, um, but not at, in, in, not flagrant about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And what about you? Did yeah. did you as a young teen going through this, see my parents, my mom has always believed in things. I'm using an analogy to mm -hmm. kind of get yours. Yeah. My mom was more serious about it all, I would say, than dad, but they both believed, but kind of culturally believed. They weren't mm -hmm. devout, super yeah. over the top. Mom Same. would get really serious when she'd go to church and she'd cry, almost like she had guilt and shame when she walked in. Mm -hmm. That environment always put that setting. But I'm had a conversion experience mm -hmm. as a young teen in middle school. Did you go through a moment in your religious life where you were really, I'd say more serious and took it more seriously, had an experience? Was there anything like that in your own life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a couple I wanted to, to share. Um, one was <laughs> when I was, when I was eight or nine, um, I stopped, like I started skipping going to the church service because I was starting to be annoyed by the content. And I remember, um, I remember hearing, you know, like the pastor must have read from the beginning of Genesis because this whole thing about creating the world, right? Because I remember turning, I remember mulling it over and this whole idea of if God created the universe, right, then where did God come from? Like, these are things that a lot of people have had. I'm not saying I'm unique. I'm saying at eight or nine, I was thinking about this. And I think it's, I think it's important to note because it does say something about where I ended up going. And that's all I'm trying to get at here. I don't think I'm special. Yeah. Um, right. Where, where did God come from? If God created everything. And also, and this was really important to me, what was, what existed to be able to create the world into like you had to have space to create the world into but space is itself a thing like i just and the whole thing just i didn't it didn't register for me it it somehow didn't connect and i started skipping church and i just like i'd go spend the time in the nursery because you know like that's way better time that's be time better spent you know anyway right. that was that was you know elementary and then in like 12, 11 or 12, there was a, um, a gospel choir, but United Methodist, you know, umbrella, but a gospel choir came to town and they, I remember going with my mom and the, I was the only one who went the youth pastor, 
um, I wasn't even technically in the youth group yet, or maybe I was, it was for high school. I don't know. There was a, something about it that I, I was the only one who showed up to go because I was there with mom and, um, you know, they did a whole, they did the whole thing. It was beautiful. We were outside concert and, um, you know, they, they did the whole altar call at the end, which is not Methodist normally, right? That right. is not a thing Methodists do. And, and I just, they were like, they were asking, you know, if there's anyone, you know, here who has never accepted Christ into their hearts as, you know, forgiveness was said, all the things, right? Mm -hmm. And I just started bawling and I just walked up <laughs> and my mom was like, what the hell? <laughs> Did not, right. This is not in her mind, right? This isn't what we do. And I walked up there and I um, met this one, this really lovely, I'm sure she was a, just a teenager, maybe early twenties, but she, you know, she was old to me and she, I can't remember her name, but we became pen pals for a while. And it was like, she was like a little Paul to me, writing to me, using scriptural language to talk to me and encourage me in my new faith in Christ. And asking me questions, you know, to kind of see how I was growing in my walk with the Lord, you know, like that whole, the whole right. thing, like, and it was sweet and I really enjoyed it. I, and I liked that she would use scripture to talk to me, you know, cause that was, that was kind of cool, you know, and, and I liked that. And so that happened, but then nothing else really. Cause she was the, Phyllis was her name. Um, she was the only person who was kind of on that vibe with me, you know, right. wasn't happening in Sunday school. wasn't a part of the youth group at all to be like that. Not at all. So then in high school, um, I followed a very, <laughs> I followed a guy I had a perpetual crush on for like, you know, eight years or whatever. I followed him to campaigners, which was a, like a Bible study with young life. So enter the young life phase of my life, right. In a junior in high school, um, I went because of him and well, I, you know, I'm a Christian and I go to church and I study the Bible, you know? And so that led to me um, going to camp over the summer. So I don't know what you know about young life, Derek. Do you know I don't know. About? I kind of want to say that you're fortunate and I don't okay. mean, I, I feel like, you know, it was a big part of my life and I'm not trying to throw that part of my life under the bus at all, but it's, it's, it's such a mixed bag. Um, so, you know, I think I was, anyway, it is a mixed bag for me because it really does in lots of ways, people, you know, older, you know, young adults, older adults come alongside teenagers at a really difficult time in life. And that can be really helpful. And I know that that is true. I also know that there's a lot of, um, there's an element of brainwashing and there's an element of fear and guilt and all that stuff that goes along with ABC, right? Admit you're a sinner, believe Christ died for you and commit to, you know, is like this an evangelical organization? Yeah. Safe to say like yeah. the, the leading kids to Christ. Lord. Right. Leading okay. Kids to Christ. Yep. Very missionary activity. Kind very, of but it's, it's, it's very, but they're fun. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> lots of energy, lots of fun things. Right. Much better than the hometown in the sense totally. that you were going through. Got it. Okay. Right. And so when I went to camp that summer, you know, the, the whole point of going to camp is to lead kids to Christ. And you go, and these are, these are five-star camps in terms of like what you get to do and incredible food and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's well set up and, and it is brainwashing. And cause you're just, you're in this camp and it's 300 kids and they're, you know, they're youth, they're young life leaders that, we don't call them youth leaders, young life leaders and all these great fun people. And, you know, they kind of just break it, break down the gospel into like bite size, you know, elements of it, like the sin talk and the, this talk and the cross talk and the, you know, and so, yeah, at the end of the week, they're asking how many kids have accepted the Lord, you know, accepted Christ in your heart. And they ask you to stand up, you know, at the last meeting, all the stuff, you know, right. And I remember there were some things going on in my life as, um, uh, in high school, but the, I, I've always kind of wondered why the young life leaders wanted, like you, you kind of focus in on kids. Like you want to get some kids who are strong leaders in cause they'll bring other kids like that cute guy that I followed. But then, you know, so like what, where did I fit in their spectrum? I'm not quite sure why they wanted me there. But anyway, um, I remember st talking with my young life leader, like just the two of us, you know, like, how are you processing this? And she was really worried about me for reasons that were actually not true. It, it didn't, weren't actually true about me. Um, and, and, you know, so I just kind of, at that point, I just said, yeah, you know, I think I, I want to, you know, kind of rededicate or accept Christ in my heart, but it was all rational and it was, 
I, you, it felt awkward and weird, but like, it just seemed like the thing that I should do. Mm -hmm. And again, a thing that I've thought a lot about, like what was going on there? You know, it was peer, was it the peer pressure? No, I don't give in to peer pressure. Of course you do. You know, like, what was that? You know? Right. And then for so the, the environment had you rededicate in a way you felt compelled in that environment to want to do that. That's why what came to mind when you said that was how many times, Derek, were, have you been saved in your life? <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> true for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I've been baptized <laughs> several times in several denominations and I've been saved over and over and yeah. over. And I mean, that is a funny joke because I believed in what saved always saved, but I'd still go up there and get but saved still, again. Yeah. Just, for, yeah, just yeah, to make yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but it didn't please. feel like that to me. It, you know okay. what I mean? Like it, there was something different. Like I'm going to really commit this time that, you know, and again, I know that sounds like it's very similar to what lot, lots of people say, but um, any, for whatever reason. Um, and I think there was also something about the fact that I was, it was now in a place where I was going to be supported with it or something. I don't know. I don't even know, to be honest, but, but then there was this like, okay, now you're a Christian and now you're going to like commit to Christ. And now you're going to do these discipleship kinds of things. And we're going to have, you know, encourage you, but you're going to walk through this program with us. And like, cause we want you to be committed and, you know, and it was all in love on their part. Like they really meant the best and I'm a good scripture memorizer. <laughs> And I'm good at like digging into the text, you know, right. so it kind of appealed. And it was with this dose of excitement and energy and, and like, you know, something alive that I didn't feel at my church. Right. So mm. I think that was part of the appeal, you know, um, for me was the energy that they had. And then, of course, the certainty. Right. Like these people understand me and they have answers to my questions and they have answers to the things right um anyway so uh, so i was that was that was the a big moment for me um big deal you come back and you're born again right like all the whole thing like all that language how old like, were you if you don't mind me asking? that was the summer i turned um 17 okay yeah and so then my senior year in high school i was kind of a um kind of a high school, like kind of helping out with the young life stuff, you know, like I'd help out with the, you have a weekly club meeting and you do fun skits and you sing fun songs and then they do a, a talk. And so I was one of the people that would help with, you know, help with running things or doing fun things. And um, so then for me, that kind of continued through college. I went to Virginia Tech um, <laughs> and I was, because I was already involved in young life, that was a you know, an automatic community for me, right. To go see who is, and I was already connected. Like I had my, you know, my young life leader in high school, or there were a couple of them. And one of them had a son already at Virginia tech in young life. So like I had people introducing me to get me there and connected. And, and then you're, you're like, you're set, you've got this fun community of people, you know? Right. And so I was, I was a young life leader for four years. I, so you're volunteering multiple hours a week on top of my part-time job and trying to be a student. I wasn't a very Dude. Um, <laughs> got it it's amazing to me actually that i did as well as i did um anyway so yeah i was involved that's where they were my people they were my community you know like it was again it was just a ready-made community we all believe pretty much the same thing we all engage scripture the same way we all you know encourage each other and hold each other accountable and you know want to encourage each other in our walks with the lord like very open about all of this language. And that appealed to me at the time. You know, it did. And is, it, is it safe to say, and I'm sorry to pause and okay. jump in. Yeah. Is it safe to say at this point in your life, you believed the Bible the way that typical Christians believe, evangelicals believe it's literally true. Um, yeah. And they're trying to make arguments for whether it's young earth creation, or if it's this or that, like these various kind of it bypasses logic or bypasses skepticism. It's more that emotional. And yet I'm not, I buy this Bible is true. And yeah. I've been taught yeah. this and told this by this group that I'm now involved in. I believe these things. And now we're looking for answers that back up those things. We believe only we're not looking to poke holes. Right. Is that safe to say? That is or absolutely am I safe to say. Yep. Okay. Young earth thing wasn't a part of our conversations, that issue, but pretty much everything else. Like we talked about it all, like it was history, you know, like this right. is what happened. And, and I believed the Adam and Eve story happened. Like, I know that I did, even though it's really hard for me to believe that now it's like, uh, no, right. I did. Right. Obviously. Yeah. And, um, and right. And you take it all at face value. I, 
today I call that reading with the grain, right? You read with the grain and you agree with the message, right? It, and it is all for your good. And it is all what God is trying to tell us. I mean, that, that framing is also really hard for people to get past, you know, because it's well ingrained. It's you're taught to think of it this way. Um, very important way of thinking about the Bible. So yeah, I was, we were regularly using scripture to, you know, to try to reach kids for Christ, but we were also using scripture to talk, to encourage each other and to, to correct each other and hold each other accountable and all of the things. And it all was, it was a very positive thing in my life at that point in time. It really was, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was like, I helped start a new club as a college student. Like this is like, I was big time, like I was in it and I had such a good time and I had leadership skills, you know, and, and people could see that. And, you know, like, so they encouraged me to do the leadership program after college and I did it. A two year training program is what it's called. Um, so I did that and you have to raise some of your support and all that stuff. But yes, scripture is not questioned, right? It is read and it is ingested and it is honored and, that's what everything you everything you've painted so far sounds mm -hmm. a really positive. You went from a, a, a very, very young person who had questions that didn't seem to have sufficient answers in a boring setting mm -hmm. in a mundane, dry <laughs> church that did not have the Holy Spirit clearly. Um, and right. then you no, got I would in my own church that way. Yes. Right. As a, when I was in young life, like they don't really right. understand. <laughs> then Sorry. you go into, no, 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 you're, this is uh, a yeah. give and take, you know, and I love your, this is your story. And and then you go and you see the, this almost yellow brick road all the way to go find the wizard. You're, 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 you're having a great time. Your experiences, memories, I'm sure were positive in many ways, but mm -hmm. you, you get into college. This is kind of your lifestyle, your people group and how you speak scripture and live scripture and I imagine it, it doesn't always stay that way. And usually somewhere in this period of, of people's deconversions, something happens, questions arise, problems, things happen. And I'm curious to know if you have any memory or if we're all, if we're there yet, maybe you have some more years of happiness you want to cover, but as you can see, I'm, I'm, I know there's going to be an elbow that starts <laughs> to occur. And I want that picture to be vivid if possible to express Maybe what you remember you were thinking at the time and how we can try to go through that with you. Yeah, sure. So there, there's a one detail I need to fill you in on for those who don't okay. already know this, but I often refer to this story. So it's um, some people are already going to know. But when I was in college, so whatever, second, third year, uh, my mother was ordained in the United Methodist Church. The Methodists have been ordaining women for a long time, actually. But and I had two different female associate pastors when I was growing up who were really important to me. I still, I still am in touch with them. Like I've reconnected with, with them both in the last, you know, five or 10 years. And they're just beautiful humans, really. Um, but when I was in college, I was very, I was using scripture very differently and engaging it very differently. And so, and I did not agree with my mother being ordained at this point in my life. Like it's a bizarre, like it's, it's bizarre, right? Um <laughs> So on her ordination day, like this is second to uh, childbirth and that's about it. Like, it, like it's a big deal. Very big. Right. You have elders from the whole conference gathering, you know, this whole kind of, you know, great cloud of great witness of people in the, you know, that you've known anyway, laying on of hands, people crying, laughing, you know, celebrating everybody except for me. <laughs> and I, you know, like I, I had to be there because it's my mom and. And I was there and I just tried to just hold my tongue. Like it's her day. It's her thing. I don't like it. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think so God. You were the scriptural Christian yeah. who was against your mom doing this and yes. becoming ordinated because the text. Yes. Here, okay. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man. Yeah. She, it's, it's, it's displeasing to God for my mom to do this. But she's doing it anyway. And and the like alongside all of it, I could see that she had like the skills, the gifting for it. I could see that. Like, you know, but right. But that doesn't matter. You find another way, you know, you you accommodate the text somehow, right? So wow. so my mother, so I don't know why I should ask my parents why they did this. All six of us, right? Both my parents and my my siblings, we were all there for this. And I'm probably my sister-in-law was probably there even. Um 
But that was in Virginia Beach, and we had a five-hour drive home to Roanoke. And for some reason, they put me and my mom in a car together. <laughs> Everybody else went in the other car. Like, what the hell were they thinking? Now this you is, have to talk. Yeah. This is one of the most important days of her life. She's literally just had hands laid on her, you know, kind of part of this community of people and leadership and where you believe in you and all of that. And I, the first thing out of my mouth. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself. Oh, I couldn't, of course. I never have been able to. I was like, Mom, I just don't understand how you can do this because it's against God's will for women to be ordained. And I meant it. I wasn't laughing. Mm. Oh, like what a wet blanket. And she didn't, she, she paused, you know, I, I always, when I tell this story, I'm like, and I just appreciate that she did not push me out of the moving car. Like, what? Right. you know what I mean? Like looking back, pull over and leave me behind. Um, But she just, you know, she paused and then she just proceeded to tell me her story. And that was something I hadn't heard her version of it. Right. I had lived it as a child, as her daughter. Right. And, and that was challenging at times because like when she went to seminary she went to duke seminary and it's a three-hour drive so she so i was in high school and she would just stay down there for the week you know and sometimes mm -hmm. she didn't come home because she needed to study on the weekends like it all made sense but it was like my soft my junior senior years of high school i didn't have a mom around you know so it was like hard not to just see it through that lens but right to hear her story and to hear her tell me about all the ways people had encouraged her. And I, you know, she wasn't seeking this out even. She didn't seek this out. People kept telling her, Mary Ann, you're so good at XYZ. Why don't you do this? Why don't you? And it just kind of progressed and it led to this. And she's very intellectually curious. It still is. I mean, she, you know, she got a doctorate at the age of 73. You know, like she's, yeah, she's just, you know, and so. Uh, probably the only time in my life I've been speechless. Like I just had to listen to her story. You can't challenge someone's story, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? As we're sitting here having a conversation about that. And it, and I just sat on that, you know, sat on it. Like I tucked it away, you know, like I hear that. I hear what you're saying to me. It doesn't square with scripture, but mm -hmm. I hear what she's saying. And I, I cannot, I can't reconcile these two and I'm going to choose scripture, but she's my right. mother. And so here we go. Like, I'm just, and I, you know, proceed, you know, so then the next couple of years, excuse me, next couple of years of still doing that thing. And I just didn't talk about it. We, you know, she was, she was a method, she was a minister doing very busy as a Methodist minister and having a great time. Um, anyway, so that, that's an important thing for you to know, because the, the piece that you're asking me about, what did, right. where did things shift? What happened? Like there are actually, it's interesting to me as, as I was reflecting on it, I was like, it's interesting that it was, came around two separate papers <laughs> that someone showed me. Okay. So <clears throat> while I'm on the training program in Virginia beach, um, the, the guy over me, the, the regional director, area director is what he's called, knew that my mother was ordained and, and, at, and he, we had talked about it cause I wasn't okay with it. And he knew that I wasn't okay with it and all, you know, and I was trying to, you know, I'm kind of wrestling with these things and I don't have time to wrestle with it. And so one day he shared a paper with me. It was a single spaced 20 page paper on, you know, on women in leadership in the church. So here's the thing about Young Life that also you need to know, and that is that it's a, considered a parachurch, as in it's like parallel to, it's not church, right? So women can be in leadership in Young right. Life. You can do, you can be president if you want as a woman. You just can't pastor a church because the church is different. We're using some of that, but we're okay with this. So it's really, so, you know, like he hands me this paper and has had actually said to me, Jen, you can go all the way to president of Young Life if you want. Like you're good. You're, this is who you are. But here's my stance on women and leadership in the church. Okay. So here's the thing. I agreed with it all. And it was very, as I mean, you could probably guess all the scriptures it's going to quote, right? Right. Uh, and it's thorough, <laughs> which is the point, right? And I had this paper and I had it, you know, this is clashing with my mom, but he's, you know, he know it all like, still don't know. I still don't know what to do with any of this, right? She's still my mom. And then shortly after that, someone, one of my former Young Life leaders was getting a master's degree 
and she was she had a course on anyway she had a course on the gospels it doesn't really matter but for that for that course she wrote a paper and in the paper she was engaging the passage some people refer to as the Martha Mary passage which i know you're familiar with it Derek but just to summarize briefly for those who might not know you know, it's a story where uh, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, studying, learning from him, right? And Martha is in the kitchen. And Martha is like, hey, Jesus, um, why don't you tell Mary to get off her butt and get in here and help me? And Jesus' response is typically handled this way. Uh, Mary has chosen what is better. You know, basically, leave her alone. She's chosen what's better. And then I don't even remember how it wraps up. I haven't read it in a while. But but it's it's so formative for millions of women like there will be conversations in in churches are you a martha or a mary do you like to study or do you like are you a you know you know or or are you a doer or are you a molar over or whatever you know like it's a thing as if there's no variation in between all that stuff so this is a really important passage okay and she was looking at the greek and she she it, with her professor you know we're talking about the fact that well it's possible and may even be more likely that what this phrase is actually saying is that Mary chose, implied for herself, is better. Instead of, again, implied, giving in to what's expected of her, which is what you're doing, Martha. You're just doing what's expected of women. You're in the kitchen and you're upset that someone else is in here doing something, not helping with this, but she's enjoying what she's, you know, like take, play it out however you want. But in that moment for me, Derek, um, I had, I, I, I do talk about this, but I don't know how to explain it. It felt like I was sitting on the stairs reading this and it, I looked up and it just, it was like a warp in the universe happened. And it felt like something opened up and closed back up differently. And that sounds weird, but like whatever it was, some sort of in my head, I don't know, but it was significant because this is Jesus saying to a woman, it's better that you choose what you want to do instead of doing what you're told you should do, right? And in this paper, my former Young Life leader referred to me by name <laughs> as being guilty of being the Martha, giving in to what is expected of her. And she knew I was on the training program and she, hmm. she's hearing all about what I was up to. Right. So she named you. Know, it's not just that she named me. It's just that, <laughs> I mean, it was true. Right. I was, I was putting, I was changing my clothes, you know, so I won't cause men to stumble. I was putting a lid on myself so that the men around me wouldn't be intimidated. And I was deferring, you know, I was doing all the things and I was do like, I was doing what was expected of me instead of being true to myself. So that is the moment. That is the thing that, uh, I, that, that shifted for me, that shifted things unalterably for me. And it still took a couple years, but I was, um, I ended up in Portland um, shortly after that, again, connected to a community of very excited young, you know, evangelical Christians through a Young Life connection, right? Someone knew a person out there, got connected, had automatic community. It was fantastic, you know, very fun people. And, but, but at the same time, it was all very, um, surfacy. I'm, I tend to be kind of deep and I, I live in the depths and I needed depths and I didn't have depth. And so I ended up calling my young life leader, the same woman who had sent me that paper. Right. Right. And she was in seminary at the time. And I was still in a place with the scriptures where I still wasn't okay with women being ordained. Right. Even though she had, you know what I'm saying? Like she'd sent me this right. paper in 94, it's 97 and I'm still like not there yet. And you know, so but the but, seeds are planted well, and you yeah, are, yeah, yeah. you're already seeing right. things. Things are already. I'm starting not, to. Right. Mm -hmm. starting, They're there. Just starting. Yep. And here's the thing. I reached out to her specifically because she's a charismatic woman and a really compassionate, really brilliant woman. And I knew she was in seminary and I didn't want to ask her about it because I didn't want to go there. Like I didn't want to have to acknowledge that she was going to be ordained soon. I did, you know, but it was like, Jen, you cannot call her up and not ask her about her life. Like you can't do that. And so I was like, okay, so how's seminary going? You know, like, 45 how's minutes. That, how's that ordination coming along? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like 
four or five minutes of me like venting and scared and uh, what am I doing? And then I do that. And and then it's like, oh my gosh, by the end of that, I was like, I got to go to seminary. <laughs> So she persuaded you in a way to take pride and be yourself. And you seem to have a passion for God's word and for the truth. And, and isn't it interesting how that passion and drive for the truth ends up coming full circle and causing you to end up exiting the very thing that you think is the yeah. truth by which you're fighting for to start with. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, the truth will set you free from the <laughs> following the truth of this. What we call the truth <laughs> isn't the truth anymore. What happened? Anyway, exactly. I'm jumping the gun here. Forgive no, me. Please, <laughs> please tell us. How yes, <laughs> that's fantastic, Eric. No, it's, it, that's spot on. It's spot on. And what? She, and to be clear, what she did really was, I think, because it was big for her, right, to engage scripture differently. And so right. she would know that that's important to me, right? The what the way I have been depending on scripture and you you know and trusting it. And so what she, what she said to me that that and I don't remember specifics, but it was basically she was asked to learn the Greek and the Hebrew and being able to engage those for herself and how that changed the way she reads the scripture and what she was learning about the Bible was made things different for her. And it did, she wasn't leaving her faith. I mean, she was literally going on to be a pastor, but she had been an evangelist. Like I, she evangelized me and here she was shifting that, but in a more honest way for herself. And so whatever she said, it didn't take long, but whatever she said, it was more, it was about, yes, searching for the truth. But for me, yes, it, I mean, it really was. It was that idea back before in that paper, what else is there that can be potentially understood differently if I can look at the Greek and the Hebrew? And she's kind of confirming that for me, that things change. She, go ahead. No, this is an important point. Just so I'm I'm rehearsing what you said to make okay. sure I'm accurate here. Okay. Because I'm relating to this. Yeah. I've read something a certain way. Women are not to be ordained, not to rule over man, right. supposed to speak to their husband in private in silence in the church, <laughs> the whole nine. You know, like like I, you know what I mean. You know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then you find out, hold up, there might be some weird loophole or a different interpretation <laughs> or a different text that actually is contrary to this or something. And and Whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? And so you are going to favor that one that seems to match your identity of what you're passionate for and what, what you're aiming for. And your friend is probably hinting at some of that, including the Mary Martha scene where Mary is viewed in a higher standard than being just the obedient, expect, do the dishes kind of wife or woman. And you're like that. The, I'm not saying I won't wash dishes, but that's not that's not me. I want to know. I want to sit at the feet. I want to know the truth. And so mm -hmm. you're still on fire for Jesus. Totally. In that sense. totally. <laughs> yes. And you're still, yes. but there's something wrong with how people are interpreting and, and, and using or weaponizing this material in a way. I could see what's happening in your head in a way, if I'm relating mm -hmm. there. And I hope yeah. the viewers can too. I, I think you are. I mean, what you're saying, you know, and it's connecting for me. Um, but I, I, you're right. It's important to note. I was definitely still on fire for Jesus. Um, I definitely was. And that was, those are the people I, co I connected with in seminary, right? I had, there was a community, you know, like there's a whole range, even at one seminary, there's going to be people just like at any church. There are people who are practically Unitarian Universalists, I, I'm for real. And then there are, there are people who were even more conservative than I was, you know, um, and uh but so I, I kind of got in with a group that they all knew each other. They were all friends, you know, whatever. Um, because I went, um, most people go to seminary because they, they're they already being supported by a church. Um, and I wasn't. Like, I was a free agent, you know. I just went because I wanted to study the languages. I didn't care about it. You know. Um, I, I certainly wasn't going because I wanted to be ordained because that would not be okay. You know, like, yeah. So I was still tracking with all the big things. I still didn't, I still like, I had friends who were, um, you know, in the LGBTQ community that we didn't specifically call it that then. And I still didn't know what to think about that. I liked them, but I still, it was kind of the same with the ordination. Like I like you as a person, but I think there's something sinful about the way you're living your life. Right. And I love you, but, the, you're this thing doesn't square but i don't i don't i'm not gonna be the one to like speak out about it i'm just gonna sit here and not deal with it because i don't I, you know what i mean 
Mm-hmm. So I, those were some, there were some big things for me to kind of confront um, that did happen for me in some way. Anyway, so yes, I was still kind of towing that line of in the way I engaged scripture and thought about the church and thought about myself in a relationship with Christ um, for sure. So, yeah. So I kind of want to, I kind of want to ask, turn? go ahead. Yeah. 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 The next big turn, <clears throat> but I almost want to dig in and if you're comfortable with sure. it to oh, ask sure. you yeah. about your private life, because, you know, we're trying to follow Jesus. We're trying to be as good of Christians as we can, but then there's the sense, I imagine you go through puberty. I went through puberty. We all did. You're drawn, attracted to people. You're dating people. Maybe things are happening in that respect. Are you having any personal life stuff that also may be impacting not just the fact that ordination for women plays a role, but sexuality and these kind of things, do they end up playing a role? Am I jumping the gun or is any of this happening for you? Well, yeah, I have a, rem- I have a remarkably boring dating life um, okay. in general, uh, in terms of my, the whole, you know, since I was 15 or whatever, um, very much hit and miss. I had one, you could say serious relationship my senior year in high, in college. <clears throat> and so some things came out of that for sure. Like just the guilt over basically having sex with our clothes on, you know, because, you know, like, what did we just do? And why are we doing it? Like, we're not supposed to do that. And it was guilt ridden, you know, we were right. both. You know, like, oh, my gosh, it's unbelievable, really. You know, it's really sad. Um, but but because of, uh, I guess because of my own, um, my own dysfunction and relational issues coming out of, we all have them, right? Our families give us lots of good things and and some, some crap. And so I think maybe partly because of my issues um, coming out of my family, I, I haven't had, I haven't dated many, uh, many people. Okay. And, and I have dated men, just to be, people are curious, um, the only dated men. Um, so that wasn't really a big thing for me until, um, until after seminary, really. Um, Got it. Sorry. I just figured I'd check the box off because some people (laughs) relate and they, they have certain things they might want to mention. Yeah. What is the next, I mean, you're on fire for Jesus. You're, you're going to get languages, Mm -hmm. learning Greek Mm -hmm. and Hebrew or Mm -hmm. getting those understood because you love your Bible. You are realizing there's more than one way to understand the Bible and that there are various messages that seem to be conveyed from this literature. Is there something that ends up happening next that takes? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I'll, I'll say this and it's, it, I think, I think everybody in this realm will go through it differently. And so I was, I think that there's an element of blinders when you're in the midst of it that I'm just discovering one piece at a time, right? I mean, the first year of seminary is it's kind of joked about that the first year they 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 go in and they just break everything that you thought you knew, pull it all apart. Second year they stir it together and third year you put something back together. And that's kind of how I went about it, although I was still very much I was still a few years away from actually having it like reconstructed from put back together for myself. Because, you know, I'm learning that that there are two creation stories and that just that pulls you apart. And I'm and you don't have a whole lot of time to process that before you get to the next thing. And like the next thing is that there are two different versions of taking over Canaan. And like, it's a lot to process. And I'm trying to process that while I'm also learning about the church history. And that's like a that's a lot of stuff to learn. <laughs> like that's mm. a lot of stuff, a lot of people, a lot of debates, a lot of ridiculous. You know, you might learn about it or consider, you might go read about it and be like, they they argued about this, but they did. And so I was in the place of trying to connect with it. You know, like this is this is my tradition. Like these are the arguments people have made. And you know, learning about each step was was all I could do. So I I wasn't doing a whole lot of like meta analysis yet. Does that make right. sense? Yep. And so, you know, um, what the the next big thing for in me, another way for the audience, you're yeah. you haven't processed or really thought heavily about the entire Correct. system here. Correct. Those Correct. who are interested, right. you're just taking in all these all this information, all this knowledge, all the facts, all the data that yeah. you're learning. And you're just taking it in and it keeps coming in. It keeps coming in. Precisely. And in fact, in seminary, they require that you do two, uh, at least one internship, no, two internships. And I did three because I'm good at two shoes. I don't know. Um, (laughs) Actually, I wanted the money. Um, And so. (laughs) 
can't blame you for that. I mean, yeah. Right. And it got me into this. It got me into the city once a month or once a Sunday, uh, once a week. Um, so just so you all know, right, like I, I did an internship as a youth pastor at one of the churches, you know, one of the Presbyterian churches in Manhattan. I did a year long, you know, associate pastor kind of thing for one of another really big Presbyterian church in Manhattan. Like I I was considered minister ministerial staff. Right. And I yeah. And all kinds of interesting stories about that. But we won't, you know, that are tangential. But I was embracing that at that point, right? Being able to do that. I was definitely okay with that at that point. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe, anyway, and I remember having these theological debates with the pastor there. I was still very conservative and he was Presbyterian, which is much more in a sense progressive. I, you know, they want to talk about baptism very differently than I wanted to. You know, they want to talk about like the family of God. And I'm like, you got to get your soul saved, you know? like <laughs> Right. And then, and we would throw down theologically about that. And it was fun, you know, it was kind of a fun to argue, but like, I was still, you know, like, mm. so, so the, um, so right. So I'm, and then I also did like a hospital chaplaincy, which was fantastic. Um, my, the, the course that changed things. So the big course for me in seminary, there were two or three that were pretty significant, but the one that's, that is key for me is the um, course that was titled Feminist Womanist Theologies. Now, where I was at the time, that title alone scared me, right? Feminist? <laughs> right. Like, like these, you know, these are a bunch of angry women. But here's the thing. My roommate and I, at the time, we were very good friends through seminary and then parted because of our theological differences um, shortly thereafter. But uh, we both were like, okay, we can do this. We want to under learn about our enemy, basically. Right. So that we know how to how to help. Us, like, so we know what they're thinking so we can handle it. I mean, it was an apologist kind of a, an approach to it. Right. Right. Like I'm going in here. Yeah. To this class that's probably going to be pro feminist. Right. And, oh, yeah. and I'm going to I'm going to learn what they teach me yes. to defeat it or at least right. give good argumentation to show why. This I don't is agree accurate. with it. Yes, yeah. totally. I mean, full on. I want people to understand that, right? We like I was I was nervous about taking this course and I didn't even know what me womanist meant, you know, like and for people who don't, um, it's just a way of talking about black women's experiences um, because of the race component that compounds all the things that are also true for most women who are not black in this country. And see, that's all the whole other thing. My point here. Right. So we're talking about. Set, we're talking about gender and race is what we're doing in this course and how that plays into theologies. So this was a course that um, I just week after week, it was something that I was like, oh my gosh, well now <laughs> you can't argue with that. Okay. Yeah. Like, or, you, or if you do, you're actually just, it's because you, you're arguing with this woman who's making comments about the way we talk about God. And her observations and comments are solid. And so people who don't agree with this are protecting patriarchy. And that is the predominant vo voice of the church. So I'm I'm confronting these reality, these things that I think are solid and important challenges to traditional ideas about God. And then I'm also getting challenged about, you know, uh, one of the big things in this course for me was the day that we were talking about um, sin. So we kind of covered all these big topics that you tend to cover and talk about, you know, like creation, sin, and all the different things. Right. And, and a womanist take on sin will suggest one of them, there are many different versions, right? Everybody's slightly different, but what, what came to the to the conversation. I mean, I can picture the room where I'm sitting with these, we're all white except for two people, right? In, the, in this, and there's like 20 people in this class and we're all sitting around in a circle one day. And I remember Regina, you know, I, I talked about like, okay, well, I understand, you know, they're talking about sin and like the, the certain groups of people have been sinned against and all that, you know, I didn't use that language, I, but you know, like, I'm like, they're talking about sin and it's like all out there in the world, like the problems in the world. I was like, but, but they still need to be saved. You know, like, like everyone still needs Jesus basically is what right. I was saying. And because I, it, it was hard. And basically Regina, you know, a, a black woman turns to me, she's like, we have been sinned against and I need you to get that. 
something like that. I'm not quoting her, of course. That was 20 years ago, um, 25. So that was, these are big things, right? To shift the way you think about what sin is, it doesn't get much more central for someone like me as an evangelical, right? You just challenge the way I think about sin? What? You know, like, and I, and again, my response was quiet and trying to take it in. Like, I'm trying to hear her out because I think it's, you know, I knew it was important, but I didn't know what to do with it. It took, it right. still took several years for that to connect for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I wonder in that class if there's, if, because they're centralizing on the woman's perception, if they're talking about some of the harmful stuff that you see about women being the reason we're in this to begin with, uh, do they cover that? Like, do they go into like, well, the Bible tends to say, you know, women are the fault for why we're in this predicament of hell or death or any of this stuff to start with because they ate the fruit. Did you guys cover that? Or was that not, was that not really a big deal in terms of the class that you can remember? Well, you know, theologians in general don't necessarily feel the need to use scripture, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, but that would be, you know, in that conversation about sin from a feminist perspective, for sure. Like you're going to, you're going to start out by acknowledging the general or traditional understandings of these things and these ideas. And, and yes, this idea of, uh, people blaming women, but that wouldn't in a the in a like a feminist theology course isn't necessarily the focus of what they're trying to do. Got it. Which, right. So um, that would be in a feminist engagement with the Bible course. Right. This mm -hmm. biblical passage gives us ideas and those have been skewed or whatever. Um, but but so all along the way, sure, there are all these elements about men and women or how we think about humans in general right? This idea of sinfulness at all um, is being challenged in a, it's being, you know, like this concept of sin, like all of it, we're, we're reframing it all and in ways that make it actually more real, more realistic. Um, and in ways that are, you know, out of the realm of controlling people in the way that the church tent had the tradition of the church have done for people and the, these ideas and what you have to believe and the way you talk about God. For me at the time, the big thing was talk, the talk about God, right? That was the biggest thing because they challenge, they challenge the fact that, yeah, in the scriptures, God is predominantly male, right? And, and let's talk and let's look at what that actually means and how that has affected us. And we don't actually, I, you know, these women don't actually think of God as having a body, but we're going to still use male titles or roles and all those things. And let's, let's challenge all of that. And then let's talk about the effect it has on people when either your scriptures or the theologians that people are reading to get ideas about how we think about the world, they're all using male focused language. Let's talk about the effect that has on you because mm -hmm. it does. And so it was very, very deep and involved and radically important. And it, by the time we got to the end of the semester, you know, I was kind of at this place. I was like, I just agree with them. <laughs> I just think they're right. It made sense to you. It totally made sense. And I didn't know how to flesh that out, what to do with that, because because they're challenging so many aspects of the church. <laughs> Like, in, in, is it fair to put, I'm going to just go pretend that I'm like you here in the sense that I came out of a very alpha male patriarchal household, very mm -hmm. traditional. I, right. And, military. Yep. And we're hearing things that we've never thought through. So they want yeah. you to almost pause and think things through. And as you're evaluating the, the literature, especially as a female, how come they get all the good stuff? these guys and we're not getting <laughs> as much good stuff here. You know, I mean, I don't know if these might be questions you've thought through. Cause I know that I've, I always use this analogy with you on here because we talk about sex a lot pertaining to religion, marriage, mm -hmm. things like that. But the horror of Babylon in the book of revelation, mm -hmm. why call, why call this mystery city. Babylon, mm -hmm. the city, a whore. A whore. Mm -hmm. Why use that language? I never pause. They think like why? And so is it, that might be an analogy, I guess. For sure. Sure. I mean, the, the thing is, it was like 
at every step of the way I started having like you do they did theology intros the second year so you do church history the first at our the school I went to and then and then two semesters of trying to do their approach to theology and so I'm taking this feminist woman's theology you know it doesn't matter uh, here's the thing. I just remember I was so good at playing along and at just like, okay, these are the thoughts. These are the, this is the beliefs and this is what you believe. And at some point I just got to the point where I was like, I don't think that's true. You're starting with an idea that I don't agree with. And I'm talking at this guy who wrote 1500 years ago, for instance. And I'm like, yeah. the pr your initial premise is faulty to me. So I don't agree with, with where you're going to go with that. And even having that realization, it still took time for me to come to a place where it was okay for me to say, I don't agree with you. And I think that's bullshit. Like I still, like I'm, I'm in count, I'm reading Calvin's Institutes for myself and I'm so excited to do it. And I'm going to outline it myself. And I start my own outline and no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, wait, 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 no, I, no, that's not who I, you, you make that's not God. Like God, I don't believe that God is like that. I don't believe this about humans either. I don't think we're actually inherently evil. And I just, you know, but left and right, I'm having that thought, but I don't have a way to fully just flesh it all out yet. And so I'm playing, I'm still just kind of rolling through it, kind of numbly, like, not sure I agree with that, but I'm gonna keep going, you know, because I've got other things to attend to. And so it's like all these pieces along the way. And well, I don't know what it is about, I mean, I do, but it's really hard to kind of put a, give a nugget about it that, you know, why is it that God language was the thing that shifted significantly for me? But it is because God is, God is the it, right? God is all. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to, I want to raise questions. I want to challenge the way we talk about this thing <laughs> that we're calling God. Um, that was a biggie for me and it became kind of a litmus test. So that whole that whole thing played i don't remember at which point in my you know those three years there i took all these different courses but i do remember that when i wrote so so the third year you're applying for phd programs and again i kind of backed into that I, I i started realizing that there were just so many things i had learned about the bible in seminary that more people needed to hear about because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was changing things in a good way for me it was difficult but it was helping me and i'm like not everybody gets to come to seminary. So I'm going to go get a PhD so that they'll take me seriously at least, or at least think they can, you know, like gives me some credibility because there are people out there. And I remember thinking and talking with some people about this, as long as there are women who are finding a way to accommodate the Bible, who need the Bible, who've been taught to, uh, you know, do Bible studies and to do all the things and to devote their lives to Christ. And this is the way you do it is through regular Bible study and devotion. As long as there are women doing that, I there would be a purpose for me as a as an educator to try to help people understand, learn, hear that there's more to it than just the surface engagement with things. Um, that was my thinking. So I'm like, all right, so what do I want to do a PhD in? You know, so I write a paper. Um, in fact, someone handed me a book that, again, this is a piece of my story, I guess, but I don't, I don't know how much of the, the weeds you want to get into here. Someone handed me um, the a book by essentially the 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 mother of feminist biblical scholarship. Okay, so mm -hmm. I had read feminist theologians, but I hadn't encountered any feminist biblical scholars, which is funny maybe, but it's like there wasn't a course that was offering that. Like that wasn't a thing that they would do or talk about, right? So a PhD student who knew me was like, and knew I was applying for New Testament programs was like, you know, hand me this book. I'm like, holy shit, this blew my mind. Because now she's talking about what's going on in the Bible with the same critique that we just I just went through in talking about God and God language mm. and beliefs and, and, and doc doctrines and things. But now she's taken that same thing to the words in the Bible that are really important to me and so many people. And it's like, like she just blew my mind. Couldn't believe there was someone out there saying these things I'd been thinking. And she said it and it set me free. And oh my gosh, I had this. <laughs> you had a born again experience. I did actually. I almost orgasmed over this. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. This so, is. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I, mm -hmm. I need to know. 
a <laughs> few exactly examples. That, you? <laughs> no, but you know, this is when I realized I was this is, sexual. Like I'm actually turned on by how powerful and important this idea is and how big it is. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> this is your, your life, right? Yes. So, um, what, what example, one or two things you okay. can maybe remember from her writing that, that went, Oh my goodness, this right here was powerful. I remember this. And it, and it did some 180 in, in your head. If you can remember. I was wondering if I have her book here on the shelf, cause it would be easier to look at it. I should have thought ahead to pull it cause it's, it's here somewhere, but um, if anyone's interested, it's it was the book um, Bread, Not Stone by Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza. It's one of her earlier ones, not her earliest stuff, but it's early. And she was basically, she was pointing out in this, it was the introduction, like it, that's all I needed. Um, that the language of the church is patriarchal, that the ideas about God are patriarchal, that people that resist acknowledging that are really just trying to protect patriarchy, that none of this is is about freedom. This is about control. And this is, and it is not life-giving. It is the opposite. It is oppressive to women. And um mm. it, that these, right? That we're that and that people will insist on these things. I'm sorry. I do wish I had I had uh, thought I, to look I, up her book. So I'd have that's it. fine. Is, that, okay. You gave a good description. Okay. I don't need an edit actual textual example but yeah. but be, based on your description makes me while we're moving in your story here mm -hmm. i need to check your brain out for a second <laughs> you what are you doing with god in your head at this time because now that you see god through a male patriarchal very vindictive jealous kind of perception we see from the biblical text um and i'm gonna ask it kind of a straightforward way do you believe in that god anymore or have you stopped believing in that God? What 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 did oh, your yeah? No, I stopped believing in that God for sure. I I think right. that God. I think everyone should stop believing in that God. Like, right, of course. But that's a harmful God. But no, and and that's the other piece of the feminist theology, which is interesting too, because I don't agree with all of it because they're also still within the church, right? But they give alternatives, right? So feminist theologians are not just pointing out that the the traditional ideas about God are male and problematic, and they're pointing out all the ways that they are problematic, by the way, but they're also offering alternatives. They're offering other ways of talking about things and suggesting that, you know, women's, you know, I don't want to get into it without getting fully into it, to be honest, but, you know, okay. because I don't want to um, sell it short. People will, it's hard enough. Um, so two things on that is that ahead. they're nego they're they're renegotiating with the text to mm -hmm. try and find softer ways of interpreting or even potentially calling out ugly things and maybe looking for good, more positive ways that there might be a good message. And you're saying you don't go that far in some cases. You're, you're, you're saying, let's just call it what it is. And sometimes you just got to leave that be. But at this time in your life, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then at this time in your life, though, you're still a believer, mm -hmm. but you're, something's happening to you. Mm -hmm. where you're seeing God, you're now seeing it for what it looks like and what it is in the biblical text. So where, yeah, where I'm, are you I'm, at? So there's a, there's an element here that I think is really difficult to communicate and that's, and but I'm going to try briefly. Um, <laughs> and that is that genuinely the, the, the language that, that there's an alternative being offered for how you can think about God that isn't what's in the Bible and, and that that can be honoring and that can be empowering and helpful. So for me, there isn't just, you know, there isn't just God. There isn't just one thing. There isn't just one being that is God because there are multiple ways, many ways that people understand or think what God is. Mm. So even while I'm in seminary, I'm seeing this, this really glaring issue and I'm embracing it for sure. And trying to do things like call God, she and mother. And that was really weird for me at first, but then I'm like, but, but why not? You know, and the fact that it's weird for people is part of the, you know, like that's, a, that's the problem. We need to talk about that. Like if God can only be he and father, then God is male, right? That's the right. Mary Daly quote. If if male if God is male, then male is God, and that is the problem here, right? Um, 
You mean so, to tell me men think of themselves as gods? Goodness gracious. <laughs> Never I know heard of that. I know it's <laughs> news. <laughs> Never heard of a man claiming to be a god ever. But go ahead, please. I'm teasing. I know. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, so I'm still believing in God, but I'm starting to think about God differently. God isn't the, the one described in the Bible. It's, it's still at some points, maybe, right? Because I'm still kind of thinking about Jesus as God, but not really. Like it's it's all very in flux. Um, but to what extent do I think about, you know, it, anyway, there's, it's anyway. So I, it's very important to me, Derek, that you and hopefully people watching do understand this, that there are plenty of people that think that believe in a God that is not at all like the Bible, not at all like what's described there. And they, you know, all kinds of ways that they come, all kinds of alternatives that they come up with or that they have that work for them. So that this whole conversation is leading up to what do you believe? Are you an atheist? Or I'm like, yeah, 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 come on. I don't want to do that because right. what, you know, we, so, so I'm still believing in God. I'm just thinking of God differently. Okay. As I leave seminary and start PhD work. Mm -hmm. And the first, I started a uh, Baylor, which is a Baptist affiliated university and everyone in the theology department on faculty have to be Baptist. They also have American Baptists, though. So there are some fairly progressive people on the faculty, relatively speaking, I should say. Right. Um, anyway, so uh, so one of the one of the faculty, one of the female faculty invited me to join to meet to go to attend church with some of the faculty on the Sunday before classes started. And and then to join, well, they saw me, I guess, and asked and invited me to join them for lunch, something like that. So I remember I'm sitting at the so I've I'm only like a month, a half a year into processing my womanist feminist theology stuff. So it's still kind of new and I'm trying to figure it out. And who I was when I wrote the paper that got me in, I'm very different from that person. It's only been six months, but I'm pretty different already. And I'm sitting at this table and the theologian at the table, the white male theologian, I remember watching him go get red, just go red because they had used the female pronouns for God in the, in the service and not just in the service, but in the bulletin. And he was so, so angry. Cherry red. Oh. He was, yeah, he was just so angry. And I was like, Oh shit, what am I doing? What am I doing here? And so that semester, um, formative in lots of ways, but one of them was, right, I have this feminist consciousness in my theological framework now and my biblical engagements now that I'm trying to figure out and learn and, you know, learn more pieces to it, more lay it more of the foundation, if you will. And I'm trying it out in my classes, right? And halfway through the semester, we had a midterm oral exam with a professor, right? So go in and talk about all the books you've read so far. And, and so we have that and you, you did fine, John, but here's the thing. <laughs> are, you good, are you sure you're going to be happy here? Because you're asking questions we just don't ask. So I'm challenging scripture. I'm not just asking wow. what's the location, who wrote this. I'm like, this is not, doesn't lead to good things. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my yeah, yeah, college. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And and like, you know, people around the table just kind of look at me when I'd speak. I'm like, if you're praising a God who's a warrior and this and that, like, what does that, what does that lead you to? That makes you warrior like that makes, that's not helpful. And they're like, <laughs> so this professor, you know, he gave me a heads up. He did. And I appreciated that. And then he proceeded to shut me down at every turn and to counter everything I said in any of his seminars. I took two courses with him in the Hebrew Bible, even though I was New Testament, because I was just, I was still so into the Bible, right? I was still so into yeah. the Bible. Right. Always have. So big moment for me. So that story, um, I tell that story because what what happened was I had to conform enough, right, to get by. And I, all I kept telling myself was, I just want a PhD. I just want a PhD. So people will take me seriously. I can do this. I can make it. I can survive. But it, there were times where it was this shutting down of, of critical thinking was, I don't say this flippantly, but I don't know how to nicely, just a little content warning here, folks. I don't know how to nicely get into this. It it had me in suicidal spaces, places. It that this I'm this sorry. issue of, right? This is this is what this field is doing and thinking, and this is how you have to 
to to to get like you have to agree with these they're they're not they <clears throat> they're going to squash anyone who challenges it right mm -hmm. Th that's what he did right away he squashed it right so i'm trying to play along and it's killing me i mean i yeah you're and broken it's bre it's just it was, it was heartbreaking it was breaking, yeah. it was breaking me and i and i d started this the second year and applied again for phd programs had all kinds of things lined up um and uh, I remember going to a conference after, and I didn't finish out the second year of coursework. And I just hoped and prayed. I was still praying at that point, right? Hoped and prayed that I'd get in somewhere else. And I did. And so I dropped out, not not having a backup net, right? Um, also, that second year of coursework, I I had stepped in as an associate pastor. Um, so the, the at the church I had been attending, so I'm still going to church this whole time, right? I'm mm -hmm. still a member. I am still doing the things, and I, as a like kind of you know temporary associate, I would do things like read the scripture, and then I would also do the call to confession and the assurance of pardon. And this was big for me because somewhere around halfway through that school year, me looking at these beautiful humans who I just adored and telling them they are scum <laughs> and inviting them to admit it, <clears throat> you know, all together and read the confession that's printed and then being the one to reassure them that they're forgiven. Like I just couldn't stomach it. Like it just, I got to a point where I was like, I, I, I don't believe in sin in this thing called sin. I don't believe in original sin for sure. But this, even just talking, bashing them over the head with it is what it felt. You know, I was like, I can't, but I did finish out that year in that position because I needed the money. Um, so <laughs> I, you're not the only one. I uh, totally agree. Right? I get it. Yeah. So all, so these are, you know, it seems, it may seem really funny that it's taking so long, right. For me to kind of come to these conclusions about all the different pieces, but it did. And I think that's, I think that's part of why I try to just, I do try to hold on to these parts of my story because that's true for other people. They're in the midst of it. You can't see the whole thing while you're in the mm -hmm. midst of it. You really can't. And so I try to have compassion on people, but so those well, were some, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, there's a lot here and I'm sure more elements can, there's always more. We never cover everything. Um, but what you've painted a picture of is, to me, is this gradual continuation of learning not only about the Bible, which is cool, and people love that when they watch Mythfish. And what I find interesting and deeper to me is what you learned about yourself along the way, because you started to realize, I am a female, and I've been working against my females my entire life using this scripture to kind of hold us down, not realizing it, of course, not exactly. intentionally, but exactly. in a sense, and this, this kind of new perspective you learned when you were in Oregon that allowed you to evaluate the harm that's done to females. And then also mm -hmm. uh, black females that are mm -hmm. in ministry or in mm -hmm. society at large started to have you ask other questions that led to more problems for the text which mm -hmm. put more of a, uh, I'm going to say, expiration date on <laughs> the, the Bible. And then you're renegotiating your concept of God. So at this time, you're you're saying, I can't believe in that God. I, I, I've got an idea of God that is different from the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And th mm -hmm. that's why we titled this uh, <laughs> Leaving Fundamentalist Christianity. If you're like me, and I'm, I'm asking the question to get your thoughts there are elements of Christianity that I've learned. I'm sure that I'm always going to carry on and how I act or what I do, maybe morally certain things that I'm sure there. And, you know, you want to try and find the good things and you want to use those good things because they have good pragmatic use. Then there's some things that just, <laughs> just don't. And they're just, I don't know how we justify them unless we were in a chaotic scenario being, I don't know. We could get into a warlike mind if someone actually came and attacked us, right? Then it's like, okay, time to do something. But um, but living on an everyday life, like what we're trying to do and better the world, doesn't seem like that's pragmatic. So, you know, I'm not pigeonholing you, and no one should have to go, well, then what, what, do you, what are you now? Are you <laughs> full-blown atheist? No. Um, but, you know, for me, it wouldn't matter because you've come out of a harmful ideology and you're now speaking out against it so come in full circle i guess you were questioning things when you were young 
you kind of went blindly into this thing. Mm -hmm. Then you started questioning things again <laughs> with a better understanding of the world around you. And you forsake the religion you were part of initially. What are you doing now as part of your life? Um, there are some more stories I want to share, but, um, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But, but I'll answer your question. Um, what am I doing now with my life? So I'm not sure. Is that the question you really wanted to ask me? I think uh, it's sure more it in the vein of like, <laughs> you, at first you were thinking, I'm going to be a minister. I'm going to pastor. Yeah. I'm going to lead these people, which meant you had a, in your mind, a calling because of the person you are to teach and you want right. to help people. Right. Right. That's really what pastors try to do. That's what rabbis try to do. They want yeah. to help people. Yes. Got it. Well, that hasn't left you. I know you well enough to know that you <laughs> want to help people, but you're yeah. obviously not part of a church as far as I'm aware. Right. You have your own church. You've carved right. your own path of people, right. your own group, and that's mm -hmm. what your YouTube and all that. So can you tell us where you are at now and what you're doing? Okay. Gotcha. Thank, thank you for clarifying what that question was about. Um, I will clear, I will say I have always been a teacher at heart. Um, I didn't mention this earlier. Like I, my undergraduate degree was in math, but it was to teach high school. So I had an education minor and some of my earliest stories that the, you know, families like to tell about little kids or whatever are about me being a, like pretending to be a teacher. I have always been a teacher at heart. And so that has been the thing that has compelled me, um, has kept me going, has led me in this direction in a sense. Once I had these realizations about my own misunderstandings about the Bible, um, I wanted to be able to teach. I wanted to be able to help other people um, learn about these as well. So I do still think of myself as a teacher. I think of myself as an educator, someone who wants to help other people who are interested, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not interested in jamming this down people's throats. That's that doesn't ever work. Um, sometimes it makes me sad that I can't, you know, connect with someone that I think I have some helpful things for them that they would benefit from. But they're, if you're not open to it, it's not going to work, right? So I'm interested in in I'm educating people, helping others learn more about X, Y, and Z, and whether that I mean, predominantly it does relate to the Bible since that's my wheelhouse. Like that's where I've you know, that's where my degree and I've done a lot of work around that, but it, it goes beyond that, like redefining God. Um, I came on your show to talk about that at one point, um, because I think that th that can be useful for people. I don't think we need to have the concept of God. And in fact, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think it's, I think there are so many people for whom it is impossible to give it up that I would like to help them redefine it in a way that's more humane and more empowering, right? And I think that can be done. And I've actually seen some examples that I think are really beautiful. Um, but I don't think about there being a guy, you know, I don't think in those terms. I don't think right. about there being a guy. I think I, you know, I see connection and things like that. So what is it I'm doing? I'm trying to help people. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to, you know, to seek their own um, better understanding about these things, right? Permission granted. Ask the questions. Ask it. That's what right. I'm Ask the it. questions. Your questions are welcome. They those are good. You if whatever your belief is about God and how we got here, you've got a brain. It's okay it's to use it. Sound funny with me asking it this way, but do you, are you are you trying to help people find themselves? <laughs> the way I you mean, said that was you know what up. I mean though. That's why I said it that way because you know what I mean. Like. Uh, paint a picture for an audience. I was going through what I call like this metaphorical journey of huh? looking for the truth and understanding what God is, of course, within my framework of Christianity. And I told this to my family when they were like, why don't you believe in just one situation at a barbecue? And I was like, it's like I journeyed these hills and then I get to this last hill and I look on the mountain. I think there's Jesus, right? He's going <laughs> to be there. And there's a mirror, metaphorically speaking. And I walk closer and I notice it was me. And it was my loved ones around me who helped me. So whatever your concept of a higher power, if that be yourself, if that be whatever that might be, you think it's something else. It's good to have that concept not be what we're seeing necessarily in that text, uh, the Bible. And 
whether you say it's yourself, whether you say it's your friends, your family, it's your spouse, it's whatever, your kids, whatever you want to paint that God, I'm saying filling in that box, is that is that kind of what you're trying to do? Let them negotiate with this idea of God. Let them negotiate with the Bible and, and allow to reject certain ideas as well along the way. I think I'm actually... Um, doing something different than okay. that um, in terms of God. Um, but, but I am interested in helping other people be more true to themselves. Right. Um, which is part of what I hear you saying there. Right. Yeah. Um, and some, sometimes that actually just is part, part of that is just under like figuring out who you actually are instead of what you've been told to believe. Right. Which is what so many people who are deconstructing are dealing are doing, which I think is great. You know, like, no, I don't agree with that good. Okay, good. That's good that you know that. Um, run with that. <laughs> um, honor that, right? Respect that. Um, one of the things I am trying to do here is around this concept or topic of God is, is pulling, is, is helping people get away from this idea that God is transactional and is this puppet master so that um, I'm not trying to help. So I guess part of what I'm saying is like, I don't, I don't think calling our family God or what, that, that's not what I'm trying to do. Right. I'm not. So I'm, if, if you're going to have this label, this, this word God, I think it needs to be depersonalized. I think it needs to be removed from any kind of, intentionality towards humans. I think it needs to be um, talked about in such a way that it, it, it's not offended by us. We don't offend it. Um, it's not, that's not what's happening here. Like that's not, that doesn't have, that's not real, right? Um, that's our own projection onto mm -hmm. God. And I, I think that that, that's where I am with the realm of this topic of theology and God. I, I'm interested in helping people get beyond that humanist human framework for this idea we have that we call God. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm just, I'm very interested in helping people let go of um, beliefs that they have um, idea letting go of, of needing the Bible to direct their lives. I guess that's, right. that's, that's been important for me. And that that's, yeah. And, and so when people keep asking, you know, like, well, what does the Bible say about that? I'm like, okay, first of all, I don't need the Bible to tell me how to live. Um, and in fact, let's look at what the Bible says, because it's in this particular instance, it's actually quite unpleasant and harmful. And so let's talk about that and, and maybe find, help you find a place where, okay, let's talk about why you need the Bible to be, directing your life. Like, what is it? What's going on there? Well, that's the authority of the tradition or the church or the family you're in or the community, whatever it is. That's what's been done in your community. I get that. But guess what? This is an ancient text written by men for men, um, addressing those kinds of needs in a very different kind of a cultural setting. And outdated views of humans and sexuality and relationships and all the things. And so I I get the desperate element of needing something to be in the Bible. I get it, but I also think that that is keeping people back. That's holding people back. And so I'm interested in helping people who are interested figure out how to do that, F figure out how to let go. And here's the thing, Derek, also, and, and I think on some level you understand this, but I've had people tell me like, yeah, I've been an atheist for like 10, 15 years, but I still have a thing about the Bible. Like I can't quite let go or it still has strings for me. And I'm like, I get that. And so that's what this is, this is what I'm trying to do. This is, this thing will help you. I think this thing could help you if you're interested, you know? So right. that's, that's kind of my helping people cut the strings maybe, right? That the Bible, their attachment to the Bible. This is an amazing the way you summed that up it beautifully, mm. I agree with. And that's exactly how I, I feel. I guess what I was saying when I said making your family God isn't necessarily actually making that God, but like, you know, that, that, that hole in us that we think we need this, uh, this agency or, or projection of, we need that thing we call God. We've been told this from Christianity. Right, been right. Told this. It's like, actually you need, you need like connection that. to other humans. You right. need connect. That's what I mean by filling yes, the hole and calling it God. Sorry. I, 
No, yeah. you're fine. No, I'm just making sure people who are watching also That's get helpful. it. Yeah. And when I went to my um, five, when I had five years clean, I went to a 12 step group that I usually don't go to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't need it anymore like that, but I right. go in to celebrate and show them that I'm thankful for this room yeah. being here and stuff. Yeah. And when I went in, I said, if it weren't for God, I wouldn't have made it. Now I'm an atheist now. And I didn't say I was an atheist. I just opened up. If it that. weren't for God, uh, I wouldn't have made it. And then I said, God being you group of drunks, G-O-D. And I said, this drunk wouldn't have made it. And of course I shared that and they were my God at the moment. And that was what, they were the power that told me I can do it if he can do it. And then, you know, it was the social setting, but That's cool. I also love, I love how that. you summed that up because what I'm doing with the Bible, I felt like I'm going to use language to make it sense. I felt abused mm -hmm. by what the text was saying to the harm psychologically in my own life and how mm -hmm. I abused myself mm -hmm. with hate this life, love the one to come, don't store up your treasures. You know, this kind of trying to do something that I I just couldn't quite fully grasp and swallow the pill to live, like the way Paul talks about it, the way the gospels portray sh certain things. And now where I'm at is I want to educate people to – what you're saying, like get them to understand what this literature is problems with it. Get them to realize like face, face it, look <laughs> at this, face it. We need to realize, wash our hands of this. And so in a sense, I'm still attached to it in that respect that I want to get people who are using it as weapons <laughs> or, to bash their family members. Like mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. and turning it and going, actually, this is man-made mm -hmm. and things like that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I had to relate to you and connect because this is your story, but like very powerfully put the way you Thank describe you. it. Thank you. But I appreciate, yeah, I also appreciate your comments and your, your part, what you're sharing. So it's very helpful. Thank you. Helpful. You had a, a story or two that you felt you needed to get off your chest and to make sure everyone knew. I did. And now I'm trying to remember what they were because we jumped ahead. Yes. I wanted to share a couple things. So, so I trans, so back, I'm still back, I'm back in my PhD work, just so we're clear. Okay. And I have transferred to Vanderbilt. So this was the, this was 2003. I don't know if these kinds of things help people. Like this was 20 years ago. And I, I'm again, the, the week, the weekend before classes start, all these big things happen, right? We're having these conversations, right? Have a conversation with two people I've just met. One is in the master's program and Master Divinity and one is a PhD student, um, maybe a, head or, a year or two ahead of me. And I'm still in contact with this person, but uh, vague generally, not, not close. But I, this was the first time I had said this out loud. Uh, you've probably heard this story before, Derek, so it's nice of you to play along as if you haven't. Um, but I, you know, I said out loud for the first time at the age of, what, 31 or something? Um, you know, I don't believe Mary was a virgin. <laughs> I don't believe in the virgin birth. And that was scary to me to say out loud. That was a scary thing. And how, right, how old am I? And I said that out loud for the first time. Yeah, oh my God. Um, I yeah. relate. Saying it out loud, that was hard. That was hard to do. And then, and then this guy in particular, like takes me to lunch. So that was the other thing I wanted to share with people, because just to say that even, even with all that's going on and all these things, like even back at Baylor, when I left seminary and I went to Baylor, I entered the ordination process, right? I was seeking ordination from the Presbyterian church because they have ordination to teaching positions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So still at this point in my life that I was that much invested in the church and in being committed to this whole thing, but with this feminist, whatever, and I'm going to do Bible stuff. I'm not going to be in a church because that's not me, but like, I'm, I'm committed. I'm still valuing the stamp of approval of the church to that degree. So when I moved to, to Nashville and I start this program, so this guy knows that I'm in the ordination process and I've just told, told him, I don't believe in the virgin birth. And he pulls me, takes me to lunch. He's like, you know, um, I, I really want to encourage you to pull out an ordination process because you don't believe in the virgin birth, like, you know, and all that blah, 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 blah. So, you know, like, and then I had to mull that over for a few months and like, you're pissing me off that you want, that you get to protect the, that you think you need to protect the church that way, or that the church can only be that and all these different things, you know? And then I was like, you know what? That's not a fight I want to have. I'm going to leave the ordination process. Like, and I'm going to be free and be happy and move on. Um, But that, you know, that was still, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still not fully, like 
gone because you know, like there's, you know, there are people that stay in the church to try to help from the inside. Right. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think there was a part of me that was thinking I was going to be something of that, or I'm not sure, but there, I, I guess I want to say there are reasons why I didn't, ever, it just didn't fully like announce and cut tie and all of that. Right. And then the next, the next spring. So 2004, spring of 2004 was the first time I didn't go to Easter service. Uh, you know, so I was kind of going to church off and on that first that first year at Vanderbilt. And I, yeah, I didn't go to Easter. And I actually was so nervous, nervous, right, to miss it, to not be there, that I asked one of my professors to join me for lunch so I could be with someone while I was choosing not to be in that space. Wow. That was how hard it was, right? And it's been 20 years now. I haven't been in a church for religious reasons in 20 years, right? Uh, I've been in them for teaching purposes, but not for, not for myself, right? So yeah, I, those were two important nuggets because of all the different comments I saw this week leading up to this conversation. I wanted to highlight that. Um, yeah. And, and there's one other, let's see, there were a couple other comments that people raised. Like when you, you mentioned, Derek, when you said, you know, there's some elements of Christianity that are still relevant or still important, you know, love and kindness, forgiveness, some, some of those right. that you didn't name any of them. But like, I, I get that. And I also think, here's the thing, folks, Christianity doesn't have the corner on that. And there Thank are you. other, right, there are other spaces that don't have all the other baggage, right? There are other realms of thought or communities and people who have all the good stuff. And they also don't have all that, what, you know, all the, the harmful stuff. Right. So, so when the question is, you know, Dr. Bird, are you a Christian? Well, again, it's similar to, are you an atheist? Because hmm, now that I'm no longer an evangelist trying to get people into heaven, and I can see and t pay attention to what I'm seeing in the scriptures about this guy, Jesus, let's just say there's a guy named Jesus and who is crucified by the, by the state, right? By the, mm -hmm. by the Romans. Um, what got him killed was his need for justice. And that is a theme I am fully on board with. That is right. something I work for. Like I, uh, this is what I'm doing with my life. Like that's why I wrote this book about marriage. Like I care about that. That is not what people usually mean when they ask if I'm a follower of Christ, because they're usually thinking all the spiritual stuff. And, and do I believe he's getting me into heaven? And so I'm more of a follower of Christ, like the guy Jesus, than I ever was as an evangelist. Because, but it's a, just a different part of his story that I right. think is helpful. And because I'm a biblical scholar and I'm engaging in these texts and I'm engaging with people who read them, that's a helpful connection for me to use. But I didn't need it. But I don't need it to be the guy Jesus. I don't, he's not the one, he doesn't have to be the one that's right. the model for social justice. <laughs> I get it. Plenty of other people um, that don't have that other baggage. <laughs> That was the question I had for John Dominic Cross. And when I sat at his feet in, uh, on the couch, we're interviewing and do we need this tradition? And he thinks you have to, he's like, we have to have this tradition. And I thought, I'm, I mean, this is his time to shine and, and not for me to interrupt or, but I'm like, do we need that? I mean, it's, it's good to have tradition, but like, it almost sounds like when you use the word tradition, that the tradition needs to stay the same instead of saying we can take this and change this. We can, we can have a longstanding change. Like you talked about, this is what I think is so courageous about what your story is and how I relate. And I'm sure viewers have their own relation to what you're saying. I got excommunicated from the Presbyterian church PCA, by the way, they weren't, yeah, they were not progressive. Yeah, they were the modern day Puritans. That's how far they came to my house on Sunday and, elders would come over and say, you broke the Sabbath. Why aren't you at church? Like <laughs> not even kidding you cultish, but they had five elders who sat me down because I was starting to think theologically and eschatologically the study of end times more preterist wise. I became a full preterist even while I was still in the PCA became heretical. You stopped believing in a virgin birth mm -hmm. became heretical. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I'm so uncomfortable. This does not feel like home. It takes courage, is my point, in what you've described as a female scholar, because I've had plenty of guys come on here and share their story, but it takes a lot of strength and courage, no matter what the haters will say, mm -hmm. to 
change based on your research and study. I think it's much easier to go with the flow, blindly accept the, well, he's born of a virgin. Uh, I, I accept the creed. Oh, I'm reformed Calvinist. Oh, Westminster confession. I nod <laughs> my hat. Oh, I'm Orthodox. Oh, I'm Catholic. Oh, it's much more difficult in my opinion to go against the grain and yet still be trying to participate in the church community. Then realize you're the wolf. You're the wolf. They view you. They kind of see you as like, you're not one of us. That's when it's quick that you got to go. I have to do what's right and I have to be true to myself. And that's why I said, are you helping people find their, themselves? You know, like, cause yeah, I feel like you are, there's so much you're doing. Is there anything else you needed to cover though? Because I know. I, it's story. so funny. Cause I was, when you were using the heretic word, I was like, Oh my God, I wrote a piece, like a poem kind of a thing about, um, you know, that I'm a heretic. Right. And reflecting on this guy who took me to lunch and like, would he have been the one throwing the torch on the fire to burn me uh, to death if we'd lived 600 years ago? Like that's, that's what we're talking about. Right. When you can, when you challenge the tradition, like you're saying, uh, it's interesting about Crossan because yeah, he's Catholic. He can't help himself. He needs, <laughs> he needs to establish it. But I, I do love that man and what he has done. And um, I think I was looking at my, um, my notes cause I, I did make, notes to make sure I covered things that were important to me. Um, I, but I have this, this has been an, an important conversation for me. You know, um, it's really just interesting because, you know, when people ask me lately, I've been saying, you know, I identify as a humanist. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to use a label. The the label atheist is a negative label. It's saying, right. right? It's preference. It's putting theism in the center as correct or proper or normal normative, and atheist is not is against that. And I'm not against, right? I'm not against in that way. I am um, trying to be humane. I am trying to help people be be better versions of themselves. I'm trying to help them in in many ways. Try to, um, you know disconnect from harmful ideas. Um, but if one, if someone wants to give me a label, like I'm, I would choose something more like secular humanist. Well, that's right. problematic in its own way, right? Because <laughs> what do you mean by that? And what, why is secular, right? But humanist, uh, I'm, you know, I believe in the good, I believe in the, the, the potential of humans. I, that's, that's more important to me than this external right. um, idea. So anyway, I don't know. I, I, I feel like we've, covered important ground yeah, oh for sure <laughs> your life is still going and yeah, you're right. such a lively person i love talking with you learning from you and thinking in ways that i'm not familiar with thinking and and it always is a good i get a new revelation each time that you yeah. come it's like you nice. know there's really really interesting things i'm gonna go ahead and yeah. and Do get a few in? of these yeah, yeah if you have Do a it. question ask it while we have dr bird and uh, thank you again for your story. Yeah. Jeremiah Miller, thank Aww. you for becoming a member. I really yeah. appreciate it. Just for, for those who don't know, I'll be doing monthly or bi-monthly, depending on my schedule, uh, Zoom chats to meet those who are members and Patreon. Uh, mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll get notified on the dates in case you can make those with uh, Myth Vision. Supreme Scientist, Dr. Bird, love your work scholarship. Jesus used slavery very mm -hmm. often in his parables. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is ignored, downplayed by many Christians? Um, hello, Supreme Scientist. It's nice to see you. Um, thank you for that kind word. And it's a great question. Um, why do I think? Because it's uncomfortable. That's why. And I remember, you know, even for myself, like, it's so funny, all these things, like, even though I've, like, left all the, the crap behind, I'm still, like, you find you're attached to things you didn't realize you were attached to. But I remember the first time I read an article that highlighted this for me, that, G, you know, on the Matthew 25 passage, where he's referring to these, they're probably, bright, like, they're called bridesmaids, but they're actually virgins, and they're probably, oh, no, not that one, sorry, a different story, sorry, the, 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 anyway, um, what, sorry, I'm getting confused about the different stories, but my point is I had a New Testament scholar point out to me that Jesus was using references to enslave people unproblematically. He was not 
challenging their realities. He was using these examples in his stories. And that is a problem. And that is not okay. That is unhealthy. That is that leads to all these other problems. And this it happened to be an African American woman, but like I I didn't know what to do with that at first. I was like, wait, Jesus? <laughs> Even yeah. though I've left it all behind. Like I'm I'm not. I don't need anything to be okay. It was still a shock to me to realize, oh, even Jesus' stories, the stories put in Jesus' mouth or whatever, are, are in perpetuating um, slavery, the frameworks of enslavement, and, and holding up as examples people who live horrific lives and that you need to be like that as a follower or looking for the kingdom or all the different things or whatever. And and it was a shock to me. And now it's like, I can't stop talking about it, right? I need I need people to see it, right? I need people to, to confront this and be honest about that. Like, And it's hard for scholars, not just Christians in general. It's hard for scholars to do that because they know it's going to be shocking for people. And their their job might be on the line. Like, it's there are reasons why this is hard, right? right. But to acknowledge that Jesus was saying things that are really inappropriate, Right. We could just say, yeah, that's racist. That's sexist. That's what is the word for for this enslavement piece? Um, we don't we don't do that anymore. We're not OK with that anymore. But Jesus said it. That mm. it just doesn't get more central for Christians than that. Right. What's attributed to Jesus, what he's depicted saying and doing. You don't get more important than that. So it's hard to be willing to acknowledge this about your guy. Right. I mean, and on some basic level, that can apply very nicely to to all kinds of people today. Help us to see why it's hard for people to. Well, I like this guy, this leader, or this person, or this you know this figure on some level. I like this part about him, but oh, that's that's distasteful. I don't want I don't want that to be true about him. Well, now we can have some compassion on people who do that today about mm. fully aside from religion. When you right, do, are you? They yeah, no. Me? Comparison you're making, making sense here? Absolutely. Without naming names, you're making plenty of sense. And <laughs> uh, it, it's a very powerful point that psychologically, when you realize it's the best way, there's like a it's like a bias that we naturally yeah. have toward yeah. people that we look up to. Right. Um, my mom and dad. I, my dad can kick your dad's butt any For day. Sure. For sure. When <laughs> your dad gets in a fight with my dad and your dad beats my dad up after I say that, I might try to go my dad actually did still get the better hand of your dad. Like you see how I think. Yes. Right, right, right. My dad, and find it's an excuse. Surgery. Yes. And, and this, it, I feel like we do that with Jesus and, totally. and of course. as believers, totally. I've said this and, and a lot of Christian friends of mine hate it. They can't stand when they go, Derek, there you are psychoanalyzing again. And I'm like, I can't help, but imagine my father in heaven when I, I mean, like here we are using dad language for God, of course, and that you're, I know how humans are with their actual parents, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes there's some people we do different things, but most of the time my mom could do no wrong. And you can ask my wife, Ryan, she would like, we would have our earlier years arguments because mom was very active and almost in the midst of our marriage when we were young. Okay. We, had, we were young, we had were kids. Young, mm -hmm. Yes. And she felt like, you know, mom sometimes stole the oxygen out of the room and had her son's attention because I'm a mother's boy, mama's boy. Dad mm -hmm. was always gone to war. Mom always was there. And just giving you a personal example, like my mom could do something wrong and my <laughs> wife would call it out and I would side with mom totally. naturally. Totally. Why the hell did I do that? Yeah. Great super chat because this could address that personal question. Yeah. I know now looking back why. Right. But I at the moment, I'd have been in denial about you trying to accuse me about doing that. But yes, I was doing that. Yeah. So I think it's human, as you said, showing empathy. But we, we're trying to teach people to think about those things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So many things about that. Yeah. Thank you, though, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Lost fan. Thank you so much. Question for Derek. Are we or are we not myth vision? <laughs> you didn't start with it. Is that why? <laughs> I don't know. I thought I said, welcome to myth vision podcast. You did. You did. Please we, answer oh. with some myth vision style. Oh, geez. No. Thanks, Derek. Li love your work. Yeah. Yeah. Lost fan. We <laughs> are 
Myth vision. I always point to it's, like it's good. Myth it's vision. good. Yeah. I feel like I don't get to point because it's I'm not, you know, <laughs> it's your channel. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, thank you so much, Lost Fan. Chris <laughs> McCarthy was touched by a story of your mother's ordination. <laughs> by the way, have you heard of church within a church? LGBT uh LGBTQ or BQT ordination? I have not. Um I can tell you that I've been trying to help and support the work of Reconciling Ministry Network and um, some of the some of the organizations I do know that are trying to affirm um, and, uh, you know, not just the ordination, but also the marrying of LGBTQ folks within the churches, within church. But uh, I don't know which um, denomination or is it like not denomination specific. I haven't heard of it. Yeah. But I, I, can I ask you a question about this? Because it's always made me wonder people go, why did you leave the church? Mm -hmm. And there's so many problems and things that you learn and just the list, write a book, right? Write a book, Derek. But the <laughs> point I'm getting at is when a tradition, a long standing, deep, rich tradition has viewed people in these categories in such a manner, you could see my why I asked the question to John Dominic Cross and to kind of point out, like, do we really even need these traditions? Because for me, I feel like maybe some feminist scholarship will bend over backwards, not all, to well, accommodate some of the hate or ugly to reinterpret and go, actually, it didn't mean that or it had no implication of that. We want to know the cultural, historical, original setting and what was meant by Paul's letter. For example, the famous Romans one thing, men with men and women with women. And what, what does that mean? Is this a, There's so many people who try to find ways to make it not that. Well, if it is something to that effect, whether you want to say it's a little different than they didn't have these ideas of homosexuality, except the mm -hmm. list can go on. I get that. But they had some concept of men with men, okay? Yep. And this is condemned, according to it this guy, Paul. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to be ordinated? I mean, this is my honest question. I'm being very transparent here. Yeah. Why do we want to even be part of this tradition? That's Why that's can't good. we start our own thing and break away from this textual tradition in mm -hmm. that way? You see what I'm saying? I, I just feel for people. I feel so bad for people who are in there and then they're going to have fundamentalists weaponize the Bible in which their tradition is kind of tied to. And here's this head honcho named Paul who is giving these words that are set in, in stone, metaphorically speaking, and they're able to attack them. You get your own tradition. You don't have to deal with that. I don't know. I don't know. What are well, your I can, I can respond to that if that's okay. Please. Um, yeah. Please. I, you know, I think, Part of my response to that is that is why there are different denominations, right? right, right. So the United Church of Christ, very affirming, um, very open, ordaining, uh, um, marrying LGBTQ folks, right? It's not even a question. Um, at this, well, <laughs> that's not true either because some of the people in the congregations aren't as fully informed about all those things. Anyway, um, I, I I don't want to dismiss your question and your almost your frustration about it, Derek, because right. I think it's a good question. I feel and bad. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. For people. And the yeah. thing is, like, realistically, pragmatically, how do you do that? It takes resources. You need building. You have to have all the things. And so so there's there's a there's an element of, well, you know, if you go to a UCC church, they're just not going to talk about those passages that are awful and they're going to focus on and the language coming from the front is always going to be inclusive and affirming of whoever is here and your identity is welcome and you are okay just as you are like that is going to be preached on that is going to be what you hear week in and week out and they're going to talk about god slightly differently and maybe not to the extent i would per personally like you know because I'm, I'm not in church but like there, there's something about like when you were saying that I was thinking about all these pastors I know who are who are very affirming and who are, you know, seeking to embrace and right LGBTQ folks. They're just that, better than these texts. That's that's my just opinion. it. The question of to what extent are they dependent on texts to be loving is actually right. part of what's going on here. So they're not engaging hateful texts. They don't, and and that tradition in and of itself, the people in those communities 
want to be together. They want a positive, encouraging word, and they're not fundamentalist about the Bible. And so we can we can have this, we can piggyback on this ancient tradition, but we're doing something slightly different. We're doing something new or or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. it's but we're still calling it church. And some people are even not calling it church anymore, right? To get away from all that baggage. But so it's really, I think part of your question is really about the the role of the the texts in these communities. There's so I'm, much there. You I mean, said I have, good. like I can think of dozens of pastors, right? Like right. that are just it's not a question. You are welcome. You are yeah. how, how you came into the world is fine. It, or it, it's, you're you talking need to change to, some of that externally. That's fine too, right? Like we're you know anyway. Sorry, I know. No, no, no. I apologize for interrupting. Um, hmm. You're talking to obviously someone who still has the chip on their shoulder and still Apparently. thinks through this like what's the Bible <laughs> say. It just to me, it's kind of weird to me as someone who comes from that kind of Protestant background. Yeah. I imagine an analogy. We'll use slavery, for example, instead of that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's pro. It's not anti-slavery in it's any not. way. It, it is, is not, not anywhere. Correct. And imagine that, you know, we're dealing with a group of people pretend hypothetically um, that they're modern slaves and let's just say it's completely anti-slavery. And within that tradition, we're going to use this, this text, but we're going to say, it, or, or at least we're going to use this tradition that's been like really affirming something that's been harmful to us for a long, long time, or at least seems to be implied in it. And now we're using it, but we're, we're going to take away those ugly, harmful things. I get changing things. I get that. Maybe that's, what's the point. It's like, we're going to change this tradition, even if there's harmful things within it and better try to better within. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Trying to I mean, think, you know, and it's, it's really interesting too, because, because of your experiences in churches, I think you don't, maybe you don't, it's hard for you to imagine a church setting that isn't as fundamentalist about the Bible. Is right. that possible? I mean, obviously I know there are way more lax versions of Christianity than what right. I came out of. I just, for me, I, it's like, let's just go to church fathers. Are we going to find some bad things toward women? Are we going to find some bad? <laughs> Where do you draw the line? Well, oh, well, we don't, we don't rely on the Bible. We rely on church. Let's go to some church fathers. I almost and find out. Like, oh no, you huh? see where I'm going with this? Like, <laughs> what are? When do we say? You know, actually, we don't need them. We don't even need this organization we call the church. We don't need this tradition that has these heroes. Mm -hmm. that are actually not really heroes to us in mm -hmm. our communities. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That's a head scratcher for me. So <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. A Aaron Colson. Hey, I appreciate Dr. Bird's work. Her Patreon chat this month was fantastic. <laughs> oh. Thoughts on how Christians are using dominion theology to shape laws in this country, oh. most recently in Alabama. Yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, but I, I'm, it's funny because I need to be clear about, I need to, I always, some of these ideas like labels, dominion theology, um, I'm not up fully on what that actually is. D um, do you know, Derek? I mean, I would I think Egyptian nationalism. Mm -hmm. in, that's what I, I imagine mean. that's what they're implying. Yeah. Um, thank you, Aaron, about the plug for the conversation. That was, it was nice. To, um, I'm also doing that actually. That's what what you're what you're starting to do also. Um so I will I, I can tell you this, Aaron, and anyone else who's curious. Um, I did pull up the ruling, the um the court ruling. It's 131 pages, but I'm just skimming four things about God and and like their theological justifications. And I had to stop because and come back to it like on Monday because it is terrifying. They are quoting from from twelve hundred like Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s. They are quoting extensively from very, from like tradition, like guys in the church from the 16, 16 1700s. Like they're actually quoting that shit. <laughs> that was my PCA church. And, and they were very active politically as well. Yeah. This is the court ruling. Like this is the Supreme Court of Alabama is quoting theological treatises in their justification like it's it's terrifying i i uh, so i am going to try to 
put do some sort of official response to that. I'm hoping to connect with someone at WAPO who's doing a trying to do a deeper dive on this kind of <laughs> I don't normally use that language um, on this issue because it's really important. And um, so I don't have a better response. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a better response, Aaron. But it is something that's on my mind that I would like to try to respond to um, in the next week or so. I keep doing that. Sorry. That's that's the Holy Ghost. Don't, don't <laughs> take credit. Don't take credit for what you didn't do. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> thank you. So oh, look at the Nobody kitty. Enjoying. She's she's heard me talking oh. too long. Yeah. Well, we're almost done here. So oh, sense. Fine. Sense of Soul podcast. Thank you for being a member and thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. These conversations are important. Mm -hmm. As a recovering Catholic, I felt like I had to grieve so much. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I thank hear you. you. It's good for you for doing what, taking care of yourself. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Sense of Soul. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And then the final one I had in the list here is It's Sage. Question What are your greatest fears? since deconversion in life? Um, I don't have fears anymore. Like I don't have any fears. What are my fears? I fear the, I fear male patriarchy, um, perpetual, like getting to continue. And I, I fear the people like that's where my fears are. Right. Or guns and sharks. Like those are my fears. I don't, I, right. It terrifies me that, that things like the Alabama ruling can happen that there are people that can get into such positions of power without any form of checks and balances on that. Like that there are so there are enough people around him that allowed that to happen, that were okay with him and his ideas. Like that's the stuff on us that, that terrifies me, but I don't feel like I fear things anymore. I don't know. Um, I like the question though. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Maybe that's not really what you're looking for. I'm not sure. I have to admit, if, if this question can be answered by me, even though you're the one who I'm interviewing, um, I've thought a lot more about death yeah. and the value of life since leaving because I took for granted – I had a weird – like chosenness about my mind and about me yeah. that God had picked me and then he's special. He would like, I have this destiny that God predicted before the foundation of the world, all of that imaginative idea. Now I'm like, Oh God. I mean, I had, <laughs> I ate a lot of hot stuff for two days in a row. Right. Just to give you an example. And I went to go to bed on the third day. Uh, notice three there on the third mm, day. Am I beautiful. a Messiah? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, I couldn't sleep for hours. Something wasn't right. And it kept getting progressively worse. I kept drinking water. I'm laying there <laughs> for hours. And then I start panicking. I'm like hyperventilating. I'm like, take me to the hospital. What's going on with me? Like these moments of, of potential health crises uh -huh. make me go, I'm not invincible. Like I thought uh -huh. in a weird way, totally, I believed totally. an imaginative thing about myself and my life. And like, I can't get harmed. If, if God is for me, then who could be against me? These kind of, cliche sayings now i'm like often thinking about what am i leaving to my kids in what way have i left an impact on the earth or you know in humanity mm -hmm. like these kind of things i think about death a lot more and i do sometimes go is it gonna hurt i don't want it to hurt i'm afraid of that like how is it gonna hurt you know that kind of thing because i've been through enough pain and to know that it sucks so those are the fears i would say that maybe i have as far mm -hmm. as that uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are other things, but yeah. I also think the language of deconstruction is interesting. Um, it isn't something I've ever used to talk about myself because it's, I don't think of it. I think of my story as been one of being more and better informed. And so deconstructing, I get, and I love that people are doing it and that they're calling it that. And so we understand what that means, right? I get that. Mm -hmm. But but part of the thing is, if be if people were better informed to begin with, there wouldn't be a need to deconstruct. <laughs> so I'm I'm coming at it from a I guess I come at this whole thing from a different perspective. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. It's more about constructing instead of D. Again, here we are with a A, right? Yeah, or a, in this a sense, kind of negative, like, yeah, it's, and it is viewed by those who are in Christianity that are you know, traditional, yeah. very yeah. stuck in that and yeah. going, Oh, they're deconstructing mm -hmm. or deconstruction. Mm -hmm. I no, get what I'm, you're saying. I'm building something better, <laughs> building something better and not just breaking down. But I do feel like I, I, I feel like the whole it feels house like, was it does crushed. feel like a deconstruction for sure. 
and we're building new walls and stuff with occasionally something's <laughs> being reused. But like, <laughs> I'm like looking at all the building materials I had and going, none of it is very mm. few things here are useful mm. anymore for this new house I'm building. And there's right. some things that are useful. Yeah. And some. Yeah. yeah. I think I just personally need to problematize the, the label. I don't right. know. I just do. I need to for myself, I guess. Right. Because, yeah, deconstruct. Anyway, sorry. That's not the point here. But I want to say thank you. I told you that I would try not to like burden people too much up front with plugging, but I have to shamelessly. <laughs> your new book, Marriage in the Bible, what does the text say? Check it what out. do the texts say? There's the emphasis on the do and the say that they mm. don't show in that. What do they say? Because that's right. our that's our point here. Is all right. You wanna you wanna talk biblical marriage? You wanna talk about marriage in the Bible? Let's talk about it. Let's be really painfully honest about it. Exactly. I'm sharing the link now. I put uh, just. I am an affiliate of Amazon. If you do purchase stuff through this link, it helps Myth Vision. And the queen of myth vision is always smiling when, when, you know, we do well. So, uh, <laughs> get, get a copy of her book. It should be on audible at some point in the future as well, but it's a beautiful book, hardcover. The one I got is hardback and it's very beautiful. Um, and the way you write, as I say, it's fun. It's not dense. It's not complicated. It's fun. You're going page to page. It's a page turner where you're enjoying your, your, fun in it. And so I hope people will get that book and let us know that you have. I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I highlight 2.82K subscribers to your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give people the next <laughs> one minute to two minutes to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, I want to see these numbers go up. What's yes. that? Wolf of Wall Street um, <laughs> meme. Yeah, Come on. Funny. You got to get those numbers up, man. Get those numbers up. Get those numbers up. We're going to, we're going to re- new or uh -huh. refresh the screen uh -huh. and see what happens here in a moment. You also have the website. What's your website about? Um, yes, my web full, full name, jennifergracebird.com. And it's, it just, it's all the things, you know, so you can get to all my socials that way. But I also have on the website, I have, um, I created a video series a few years ago for people who are like working through what to do with the Bible um, on the topic of marriage. So it's kind of a, parallel to the book um, in terms of the content, but it's, it's a video series created to help people. Like you watch a video on an idea and then you talk about it with people you trust, right? So it's right. that kind of a trying to help you process, not just listen to a lecture, but like take in some ideas and process for yourself. So there are all kinds of things like that. You can get to my books there. Um, I'm working on a podcast, just an audio podcast, um, very professionally done, separate from YouTube stuff. Um, so you can just see all kinds of what I'm up to on my website. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the books, you have other videos people can help. And does it, that helps you have a Patreon Mention that as well. Oh, you hang out with your Patreon. Yeah. I, um, I have a Patreon and I have started doing a, um, every, every third Thursday. So the third Thursday of the month, I'm going to, uh, sorry. Yes. The third Thursday of the month, I'm going to go, we go live. So I just have, um, just like what you described that you're starting to do, Derek, on I'll send out a Zoom link to those who are supporting me. So right through my Patreon, not just the so not free, but any at any level of giving and supporting me financially, because that's, you know, that is helping me to be able to do the work I'm doing. Right. Exactly. So I'm really pleased with how it went. I'm looking forward to more of that. Um, yeah. And your community, you got a great community, I'm sure, of Ooh. people. I do. I love that people would show up for my, I do a live stream on Thursdays also. Like that's just something I've been doing for about a year and a half and, or whatever, uh, for not a year and a half, but I've been doing live streams and, um, call it story time. And it's at this point, it's, I'm either doing story time on my own. So I'm reading a biblical passage and giving all the commentary on it that I think is important to give. And then recently I just started having, I'm starting to interview academics. Um, so people who are not, trying to be public scholars, but they're, they're just honest to goodness academics. Yeah. And I'm just trying to help people discover more because I think there are a handful of really lovely public scholars, right? Mm -hmm. But there's more scholarship out there that help that I think can help people to just know that there's more than just some of these. I don't know. I, I, I hope that makes sense, but I'm that having a great time. Is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> I know yeah. it is. I know it and is. I, yeah. So that makes perfect sense. And I can relate. And I love that. And I'm certain you're going to have scholars. I've never 
don't even right, know that you exist. Know about yet. Yeah, of course, because of their, it's been my field. But yeah. And so the people it, that show up there are just so fun. You know, the people. That yeah. Show up there. yeah. I love that. I love that. I'm, I'm hoping more people will tune in. Have you subscribed yet to her YouTube channel? <laughs> I Did I did I mention that if they don't, they're going to get eternal conscious torment I, in hell? I think you need to remind. Yes, good. You remind. Right. Them. So <laughs> let me remind them. We love you so much <laughs> don't want you to be we're all loving right. but if you don't subscribe to her youtube channel you <laughs> are putting yourself into eternal flames so you know that's how much we love you we're giving you the chance uh yes. to to do that okay okay i'm being silly i do that from time to time forgive me we're yeah. gonna go ahead and refresh yeah. are, are we ready sure 10 i'm actually a little nervous now like <laughs> nine <laughs> making a thing of it I'm like yeah Eight, fine. right fine. i'm fine i'm fine with it seven six five four three you are so funny two and a half <laughs> two thanks james i saw james apperson put, put it in there. <laughs> one and a half <laughs> one this is how much we love you. You see how we're going into right. decimals Making here. Making right? sure that you all have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 0.5. We're doing Second Peter 3, a day is a thousand years. <laughs> you know, we're stretching time here to make it, you know, it's a 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6. Okay, okay, okay. Time's up. Refresh. 2.86. So I think you've got 40 new subscribers, I think, so far while we've been streaming. Which is pretty exciting, you know. Very, very uh, exciting. Uh, I think. Yes, yes. I'm grateful for all the all the love. Oh, hey, Christine. <laughs> She's she used to be a librarian, um, and so and she is just the most delightful person. Oh wow! Thank you so much for becoming a member. Really appreciate that. Okay, any final words from you, Doctor Grace Bird, <laughs> Doctor Jennifer Grace Bird? Sorry. <laughs> I feel like this has been um, a fun conversation. I appreciate you hosting it um, and pushing me to do this. Actually, I feel like I should say that that pe let people know that you um, you have been very very important for me. You've been very supportive of me for four years now, um, and it was your idea to do this. Like you you had to talk me into this. Um, I did partly do that. you did you had to talk me into it, and it was your idea. And I appreciate that. I appreciate your support and the fact that you do you put your money where your mouth, <laughs> like, you know, like you say you like my work and then you do yeah. something about helping me and supporting me. And so thank you for using your platform to help highlight some of what I'm trying to do. I appreciate that, Derek. And I wanted people to know that, right. You, um, you. have been encouraging me on how to do, how to use YouTube to make a difference and what to do to, you know, to kind of make things work better and all that. So you've been kind of a bit of a coach or a mentor to me in this YouTube world <laughs> and I appreciate it. I really Thank do. you. Yeah, that Thanks. means a lot to me, and I'm thankful for your courage because you were very nervous. I must admit, you were very you, not sure, right? The role you, of labels. Yeah, it's the way labels work, and that was the biggest in my work, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's you didn't issue. you didn't want to end up coming up here and going, I have to have this uh, conclusion where I'm now an atheist, or I have to say that I'm this thing. And no, you don't. Well, I well, don't expect that. Even. Like, since we're talking about it, it's even the label, like, on the thumbnail. It's, like, person leaving fundamentalist Christianity. Like, the whole conversation. And I watched some of the chatter about, oh, what's a big deal? Or, it's a big deal because she's this. Or, well, it's actually, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right, like, right. And my field and in the work I'm doing, so, sometimes people care. And so, mm -hmm. it's interesting to me how, I, how I'm still, yeah changing in terms of what my role is when you ask what it is i'm trying to do these days like what is what is it you're doing i'm like well that's a really evolving kind of in the moment <laughs> right right <laughs> because you know what i mean so it's well, i respect a, that and i did not want you, i told you too i was like listen i you you have every right in this discussion to explain wherever you're at whatever you've come to the conclusion and i respect you you could have come out and said whatever. You could have said, I'm a theist. I, I don't care. It would not have bothered me at all. No, no I know that for you. Right. It's right. The, the reality of our the world we live in. Yeah, is, was, tribalistic. Sir. Well, and just, yeah, and just 
anyway, it's, it's, it's a good thing for me to have done and to just own it publicly and do with it what you're going to do with it. Right. People, you know, so the issue is about my work and my place in the, you know, it's, it's, right. it's not about, I, it's, there's nothing, I'm not embarrassed about what I think and believe, you know what I mean? I get it. And wait, you're wait, absolutely wait, correct. Wait, Trust wait. me. You're not the only person I'm sure. <laughs> who has had that concern. Um, I think Dr. Munger was, was a little wondering. concerned about his deconversion story. And yes, colleagues heard about it, but he got a lot of compliments and a lot of respect from colleagues. Even if they disagreed with him, they were like, that took a lot of courage to say what you said. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people who are going to watch this mm -hmm. and they're going to feel like they're not alone. Right. For that's what made me decide to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you, the people is going to help. Like that's it. Right. And yeah. as a female doing this, that, means a lot to me too because we guys can go and talk all the shit we want but like it it really was powerful to have you on here and hopefully sets a path for other academics who can be comfortable telling their own version of their own story it does not have to be a set path it could be whatever but i'm hoping to also explore that more with other academics in the field hmm. well good luck with that i, I know like i don't think i could have done this if i were at an institution that's scary it's real. That's the thing, Derek. It's real. I actually have questions. Like I'm thinking about the fact that I only teach online for community college in, in the Northwest. And this, this process went through my mind about those that like, I'll be fine. This is totally fine for them, but they're, th that's the point. Like this is political and it's power and it's money and it's all the things. And wow, you're not going to get many academics to, who would do this. You're just not. And it's, I'm okay. I'll be okay because I'm trying to make this thing as a public scholar doing something different. And that's what I'm trying to focus my energy and my attention. But that's also why it was okay for me to do this. I, I wouldn't have when I was at Greensboro College full time. I wouldn't, I think it's important I wouldn't have when I was an adjunct at University of Portland because I needed that money and they would not, they would not have given me courses if I had done this then. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. I think it's important for me to say this as a host, as someone who's been successful on YouTube and knows what it's like to try and make a full-time online thing, support Dr. Bird. If you like what she said and you can be part of her community at whatever small cost, a coffee mm -hmm. at Starbucks mm -hmm. cost a month for one, you know, one time, do it. And as many people as possible go and do that because this sucks. It sucks that we can't just get people to just be able to do that without the risk of their jobs and their careers and stuff being transparent. So back up the people who had the courage to do that and help support them because we we need that help. Thank so that's my saying. I'm saying it. I hope you'll help Dr. Bird become a patron. Uh, comment on her YouTube videos. Let her know that you saw the stream and compliment her. Mm. Nothing hurts more. Uh, you know, then people who are just nothing but trashing and things like that. It's show some love. Those are the people that help our days have the sunshine. You know, it's, it's good. People make you feel good when you have good compliments and comments under those videos. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. All right. I told you I wasn't going to open up with a cartoon. Did you want me to close? It's your call. Them? No, we don't, no, you don't need to. We don't need to. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody hit the like.